Okay, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, so the <clears throat> first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, as I um, recall, I don't, I don't think there's any deviations that we need to make from the current online agenda unless um, someone else has other information. Okay. All right, so uh, with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. So on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and if you would uh, say your name, where you live and try to keep your comments to about two minutes, uh, that is helpful. And that's true for the rest of the evening as well. Um, and uh, yeah, but if you have a comment that is pertinent to one of the um, topics on our agenda, then we'll take it up uh, at that time. But if it's not, if you have something unrelated, now would be the time to discuss it. Um, anyone in person have anything they would like to comment on? Okay, and anybody online? And uh, you can use the raise hand icon under reactions, or uh, you can just unmute yourself and let us know that you would like to speak, but I am not seeing anyone. You can also turn your camera on and wave, also an option. Um, all right, so we're going to move on then because I'm not seeing anybody. Uh, all right, so um, on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Jack. I move the consent agenda. I'll second it. Okay, the motion in a second. Um, any further discussion about the consent agenda? Okay, I just want to point out that I'm really excited that we are um, officially funding the Capital Area Neighborhoods Project. And that's a part of uh, our consent agenda um, this time. All right, any further discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, wow, we're moving. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we have a few appointments to make. Uh, these are student appointments um, to the tree board. And I don't see uh, Ethan Borland or Ben Weatherall here in person. Just wanna see if they are online. Ethan or Ben, are you also perhaps under a different name? But I don't think so. Okay, so um, with that, um, uh, I'll just say I'm thrilled and delighted that both Ethan and Ben have stepped forward to um, be student reps on this board. Um, any, uh, is there a motion? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Can, can we point to? Yes. Ah, that's exciting. They're, okay. I'd like, they're not voting members. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to move to uh, appoint Ben Weatherall and Ethan Borland to the, the tree board. I second. Okay, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right, well, thank you, Ethan and Ben. I am just delighted that you are um, going to be working with the city on the, on the tree board. That is great. Okay, uh, and so we are on to the Energy Advisory Committee report, and uh, Kate is here. Welcome, Kate. I'm Kate Stevenson. I'm a member of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, um, and I had hoped tonight to be able to present to you um, our fiscal year 2021 um, energy metrics, but unfortunately, kind of trying to pull all the data together at the last minute. We didn't get everything in from the school district in time to be able to present tonight. So hoping I can get a rain check for um, a meeting in sometime December, January, when we can come back with the, the full report. Um, but I figured I'd still keep my slot to be able to give you a little bit of an update what we've been working on this year. Um, so in terms of kind of the work of the energy committee, the first half of the year was very much focused on our net zero action plan, um, which you were presented in August with our team from VEIC, uh, the consultants that we worked with. Um, and that's really, it's a 10 year plan to look at how we can bring all the municipal buildings and operations to net zero, which is in line with the, with the city's goal. 
Um, so that was, that was a big push. Um, we've identified some really clear next steps out of that plan. And now we need to get on to the good work of actually doing it. Um, <laughs> the other things, um, big project that we were working on this fall was the window dressers project. And so that's a collaboration with a nonprofit based in Maine. Um, we did it two years ago, actually, in January 2020. But what they do is they work with community members and volunteers to build uh, storm window inserts for low income residents. Um, so this year we were able to partner with some folks from the Mad River Valley. We went out, measured a whole bunch of windows. We just finished building them on Monday. We built 262 windows for 41 households. And about half of those were able to be provided for free um, through a grant that we had received. So it was a huge lift, um, but it was also really fun for folks that came out and got to chance to volunteer. Um, and I think we're, we hope to continue to do that annually going forward. Um, and the other big project that you may remember was back in May, we finalized the uh, home energy labeling ordinance um, to be able to provide a way for people to provide in for energy information about their homes at the time of sale. Um, and we're continuing to work to you know, figure out some of the implementation pieces that need to, to go along with that ordinance um before next july when it goes the enforcement goes into effect so that is ongoing um and i guess at the you know so those are kind of the the three big things and i will say you know we think as a committee we have struggled to maintain some momentum during covid we have we have lost a number of members so we're actively recruiting if you know of anybody who would be interested uh to try and find some more people to join our committee um and we've also been working with um, folks at the wastewater treatment plant. Their the you know feasibility of the phase two project. I think you'll be hearing more about that, if not tonight, in this meeting soon. So definitely um, have been able to participate and chime in on some of that. Um, but I just wanted to bring to the council's attention one of the things that we've really struggled with, which is um, kind of how to maintain momentum with the city staff to actually implement these projects. Um, and as you remember, we for briefly had one day a week, Steve Twombly, who was doing some project management. That was really helpful. Um, we had got into the budget in fall 2019 to have an energy coordinator position, but that wasn't a position, standalone position was never hired. Um, and you know, we really feel like there needs to be dedicated staff attention to this um, and we're not going to be able to implement the net zero action plan without some additional you know the, as volunteers on the committee we just can't do it on our own so i just want to emphasize to the council like you've made these commitments you've set these goals we've got a plan in place but to, to be able to really make it happen i think the the committee of volunteers can't do it on our own and the staff the existing staff are doing lots of great work and they just you know this is not their number one priority so just to kind of reiterate the things that we've committed to that an energy coordinator could do if we had one um you know one is to work with the department heads to figure out their individual plans to bring their departments to net zero and kind of the details that go along with the action plan one is monitoring and measuring the city's energy use um, you know, the data that I was going to present you to you today is stuff that I've been tracking for about five years now. And I want to give a shout out to Todd Preventure, our former finance director, who has come back temporarily and has been helping out with this project. But um, we just, you know, it takes a lot of time to track all this stuff down. Um, and it's not in any particular person's job description. Um, and, and even when we fought, when we're able to collect the data, you know, once a year, sometimes we find things and we're like, huh, that's strange. Like, why isn't the solar system at DPW working? You know, like we find things that if it was being checked more than once a year, maybe could be resolved. But um, we also have the net zero revolving loan fund. Um, we really haven't had any activity 
using the loan fund this year. We don't really have any projects lined up. And again, we kind of need um, city staff support to really kind of scope those projects and get contractors lined up. Um, so that, you know, it still exists, that we have funds available. We just need help to get projects moving. Um, there's also the district heat utility. So um, whether there's a move to grow it or improve it or improve the efficiency, that is something that an energy coordinator could do. <laughs> um, and then we also have this new ordinance for home energy labeling, and there is going to be need to be some staff involvement in um, the enforcement of the ordinance and just checking to make sure that people are doing what we've asked them to do. Um, so right now, you know, those things are happening. They're, it's spread amongst a lot of different people and a lot of different offices and departments. But I think we could really benefit from having some focused attention to it to be able to really like leverage the skills and the expertise of the Energy Committee, um, but have some additional staff support. Um, so that's what I want to leave you with. And I hopefully I will be back in a month or two with all the fun charts and graphs that you've come to expect from me uh, <laughs> to report back on our energy use. Um, you know, there, there's some really, you know, the, I'll give you a sneak preview. There's some really big wins. We shut down the district heat summer loop and that saved us. We went from spending about 15,000 gallons of oil every summer to less than a thousand gallons this past year. So that was a huge win. Um, and yeah, so there's some, there've been some other improvements. It's because of COVID and because of shutdown of the, some buildings, you know, we'll, we're gonna see savings in certain departments that may not continue uh, for, they're not maybe like true ongoing savings. So this year and last year, it, it's gonna be a little tricky to, to work on the data, but um, I'll be back. And, uh, but happy to, before I sit down, I'd happy to take any questions from the council. Donna, go ahead. Even without your graphs, your information is priceless. So thank you. <laughs> but I do want to know, where did you assemble these windows? Oh, we um, we did it at the mall. So the Berlin Mall, um, they have a space called the Hub that they offer um, for very low cost to community groups. So they can use some of their empty. Did you take any pictures? Oh yeah, did I have lots of pictures. Said that. Did you take any pictures that we could you could share with us maybe next time. Sure. Yeah. Give me some pictures. Any other questions? Hey, good morning. Thank you, Kate. Always appreciate and obviously very enthusiastic about moving forward with all this. Um, just curious, um, have you all looked at all at like I know that there's a few towns in the upper valley that have done like a shared energy coordinator position. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any opportunities there if that's been explored at all. I mean, I would support. Uh, yeah. It sounds like there's a lot of work for, <laughs> for someone to do <laughs> anyway. Um, but I was just curious if that is something that anyone's been talking or thinking about. Um, and then I know that the RPCs had also gotten increased capacity. So I don't know if that's been something that's been helpful or a resource at all, or something that we should be taking more advantage of just those funding ARPA funding that yeah. was put in to basically help communities better access those American Rescue Plan Act funds for energy efficiency projects. So just curious if we've seen any benefits of that yet. Um, well, yeah, I'll answer the last question first. So there was a webinar on when a week ago, Wednesday, I think, um, for towns to learn about how they can use the ARPA funds for energy efficiency. I wasn't able to attend. I think Donna Barlow Casey was going to try to attend, but I don't know if she was able to. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's still coming down. But, you know, the RPCs, we haven't had a ton of interaction with them on the committee. Uh, they, they collect a lot of data, and then, like, once a year, they'll send an email being like, here's your data, Montpelier. Here's what we think you used for electricity, which is interesting. Um, and, you know, is, is a peak at kind of the community scale energy use, at least on the electricity front. But um, yeah, it might be worth reaching out to them again, because if they do have more capacity or more funding. Um, and to go to your original question about the energy coordinators, I mean, I haven't heard any talk about a shared 
position here in central Vermont, but I do, you know, when we were originally I kind of we wrote like a draft job description back two or three years ago, we looked at the job descriptions that they have for the other towns in Vermont and also like, I mean, Hartford, Lebanon, New Hampshire, um, I think there were four or five towns that we looked at, at like how they define their position and, and use that to inform the one that we drafted. But yeah, there, I mean, it also, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a full time thing, it could be now we could get a lot done with two days a week or 20 hours a week or something like that. Um, but just having someone who's like focused on that, because I know it, it, you know, it, it has been handed to Donna, but you know, to do that and be the director of public works is a lot of, to ask of one person. So. Great. Any other questions or comments? Just great as always. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> great. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Kate. <clears throat> Uh, and any other, um, since we're here, any other comments from the public or e either in person or online about this topic? Okay, great. All right, so uh, we are going to move on then to uh, the City Recreation Center development options. And um, I know a, a number of folks are probably here for that. Uh, so I, I, I'm turning it over to Arnie and Cameron, I assume. Yes, I'm going to mostly okay. turn this over to Arnie. I'm okay. going to be the dedicated slide clicker. Um, just FYI, uh, our technology is still broken. Oh, no. So we will not be sharing the slide as a presentation, but just as individual slides. I'm very sorry. It's very ugly. But we make do with what we have. Um, so, it's... and share the screen, and I'll sort of just turn it over to Arnie. Um, we're very excited to present some uh, new and upcoming options to consider when it comes to the recreation. Uh, oh, that's me. Um, I'm going to shift seats here. <laughs> Not directly underneath it. You hit the light on your way by. What's that? Or hit the light on your way by. Oh, yeah. You, you got it. Oh. Oh. Okay. It didn't, realize, didn't realize you're only moving that far. <laughs> yeah, just this far. <laughs> I just going to do it, but from the video. Oh. Yeah. All right, Arnie, it's time for you to introduce yourself. All right, I'm Arnie McMullen. I'm the recreation director um, in Montpelier, and I am very excited. Sorry. What's that? Not hearing you. You got to project. <clears throat> okay, I'll use my gym voice. Um, I'm Arnie McMullen, the Recreation Director in Montpelier, and we're very excited to share some options that we've been talking about. Um, we'll start by talking a little bit about, you know, some of the community needs or wants that we've seen, and it's right there on the first slide, so I, I won't read through everything, but um, one of the things that you know, folks in the city want is is low cost, high quality facilities that reflect community values and wants. And one of the things that we take pride in as a city department is trying to keep costs affordable for all of our participants that want to participate. Um, we have gathered information from some past surveys and, you know, some of the things people would like to see is you know, what we have listed up there, basketball, more pickleball opportunities, indoor walking. I want to change that to a multi-use track because so many things we do today, a lot of things people like to do in the rec center is also rollerblade. So we do have some groups that rollerblade in there. So we want to make sure we keep, you know, those thoughts open. Um, we've had some very good years over the last few years where we've raised uh, in our revenue somewhere between 250 and $300,000, which is a huge help to keeping our appropriation down to the community, um, you know, through programming and opportunities that we do. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we're, we want to do too is create more opportunities for growth right now in our current facility. Um, we're pretty limited with space and we'll get into some of the renovation thoughts on that. Um, growth for oper for programming um, and community wants more recreational opportunities as as most of us do. We always want the most bang for our buck and uh, we're trying to find ways that we can actually grow as a department. Um, 
So the, the first option that we were looking at originally prior to COVID was renovation of the current facility. Um, the downside to some of the um, plans behind, well, let's not go to that yet, but <laughs> you know, it, it, the renovation plan is to make the whole building usable. So that way there, it would be ADA accessible. We'd be able to use every floor. Um, part of the thought process too was the heating units would actually be on the roof instead of in a room. So that way there we could use our full basement as well, as well as a, a cooling unit. So we would actually have uh, central air in the facility. Um, the one thing that this building currently doesn't have, which the renovation will help take care of, would be uh, bathrooms and locker rooms for both men and women, and also a gender neutral um, bathrooms as well. So, and you can see in the downstairs space that there's there's room for four exercise rooms or, you know, a weight room facility with, you know, limited weight projects, uh, limited weights, um, an exercise room for possibly spin cycles or different things like that. And then some open space for different programs like yoga and other things. The yoga could be a little challenging down in the basement after further thought with basketball on the first floor. So, so that we would probably rethink and put them upstairs. <laughs> the first floor level, what we, would re, what we would do in here is redo the gym floor. So you'd actually have a new wooden floor in that space. We would have an office space as well as classrooms. Um, and we'd have a neutral gender bathroom on this floor as well or a family bathroom so that way there anybody with kids and everything could use that to um, make that easier for them <clears throat> the upper floor well there's also a proposal for solar panels on the roof and oh, i skipped over one uh, we'll go back to the second floor so the second floor we're looking at is has some offices up there. Um, it also has a conference room. And depending on what we actually need for offices, we could make an adjustment on those and also have it as another conference space um, or rental space for, for quieter programs. Um, but part of the idea too is that, you know, if we get our after school childcare program really growing, is to hopefully have a, a full time director that would actually oversee the child care program because if we grow that to where I'd like to see it happen, we'll be we'll be extremely busy. So that said, that is the overall um, renovation ideas on that facility. Um, benefits is that the city it's a city owned facility. It is in the heart of downtown. Um, making use of all floors which is something we haven't really had. We generate a pretty good amount of, amount of revenue just renting out the gym from year to year. But if we get it so we can actually use the whole facility, we could actually rent spaces downstairs and upstairs as well. So that would really expand on some, some revenue opportunities. Um, the limits to this space is there's no room for expansion. I'll just go through some of the, the really big ones that we're concerned about. The cost is estimated at around $5.2 million just to renovate. And a real big challenge is that there's no additional available parking. And parking is a huge issue as, as much as we'd like people to exercise and do all those really cool things. Some of my highest intense exercise groups actually want to park right in front of the building before they <laughs> run in and play basketball for an hour. So so those are some of the, the the honest challenges we're facing that a lot of people do drive and we do have some parking issues around around the area due to such limits and as you know the senior center already has challenges with parking so when we're really busy at the same time then of course people park over there as well um and another downside um just as a thought is it would really limit some of our special events like one of the events that we're having challenges um this last year we weren't able to do because we couldn't get a space was a ski and skate sale um and that gym the last time we did the, used our gym for the ski and skate sale was like 27 years ago um 
And now since we moved it to the high school, we basically doubled the space and the amount of equipment. So we could really never go back to a smaller space as that, that has grown as well. However, going into the new facility thoughts, COVID has gave us a lot of time to think because we were um, put on hold with everything, which I totally understood. And it gave us a lot of time to rethink some things because originally when we were looking at facility ideas the, the, the first time, we were including a pool with it as well. So the, the cost seemed very prohibitive to folks appetite because I think we were talking like around a 14 or more million dollar facility. So what we're looking at doing is is creating a new facility and we are working with a company called Breadloaf who's supposed to they're working with us they're going to do some drawings on what we could possibly do within this space to maximize the use and what I'd like to see as a as a thought process is that we'd have at least two to three basketball courts in there, high school size basketball courts that would have multi-use lines on there. So we could do many other programming things as well. An indoor multi-use track. We would also have <clears throat> um, rooms for classes and exercise rooms, as well as meeting rooms and probably try to create rooms that could be linked together to create a conference space. Because one of the things we really don't have in the city as well is a good, a, a large conference room that could host uh, multiple groups from around around the city. Um, we would also want to see what the other thing we thought of with this too is we have a huge need for uh, basically year round access to bathrooms that we could put a door on the outer part of the building so they'd be accessed from the outside and heated so that way there we didn't have to worry about them freezing currently we behind the stadium we have some bathrooms that are basically open from april until <clears throat> usually the end of october when the water doesn't freeze because we can leave the doors open but this time of year we don't have that access um, so this would create that opportunity for anybody in the park to have an opportunity if they're renting the pavilion and the pool's closed or for some reason there's a baseball game and it's very busy over there, they would have bathrooms right next to the tennis court area. So, which I think would be a huge plus and, and be available on weekends for those groups that are renting the pavilion. Um, this would also create more opportunities for our summer camps as far as our summer day camp that would be actually our officially licensed site currently right now it's our pool house but this would allow us to not only have that program hosted there but we could also do some of our soccer camps if we had to move inside uh, or <clears throat> any other program we have down there that needed to be inside due to the weather uh -huh. it would give us that space um, it would also allow one of the things we we're looking at on this was having a actual garage door that could, you'd enter from the outside for programs such as our ski and skate sale where we have trucks pull in to unload we could actually just go straight in the building and have the trucks park at the door and, and literally unload trucks um, really simply and then I know your eyes are getting bad when the, oh, the a little off. bit of lights are off um, Let's see. It also puts a lot of our facilities in one location. So now we have, if we had a rec facility down at that space, we have the pool right there, we have the baseball fields. So a lot of our administrative tasks could be handled right on site instead of having to scoot across town if something, something happens down there, which knock on wood, we've had good luck and hasn't been a big issue. Um, some of the limits, it removes a, you know, the recreation field. It does take a field out of use, but I think there's ways to work around that. The parking's still a little bit limited, but it's far better than the site that we're on right now. Um, um, and the cost for this building, I'm going to adjust that just a little bit, but I think Breadloaf said somewhere between, I think they said five and seven, didn't they? Does that sound about fair? So between five and $7 million, but it's for, a, again, a brand new building and um, one that should meet the longevity for the community rather than, you know, I'm, I'm afraid with the Berry Street facility that with 
you know, so a lot of effort, we're going to outgrow that space pretty quickly. Um, not to mention that we don't have um, the parking to begin with. So that makes it challenging. But I want to see for the capital city of Montpelier that, you know, we have a facility that we're going to be able to grow with into the future. And I think I look at Montpelier as the hub on a wheel, for lack of a better term, or in the surrounding communities come in on the spokes because every community that we set up for our youth basketball program, our youth soccer program, drives through Montpelier to go to another community. So it's kind of a neat setup for the community to have something that creates that kind of convenience. And it's gonna draw a lot more people to the community. All right. And option three, let's jump into that. This is, this is an option that became a new idea for us because we learned about this a little bit later, but there's a group that in Montpelier that's called The Hub, and they're looking at doing some work with the Elks Club and trying to develop a facility for themselves up there, but there also is room up there for a facility for the city to build up there. And we have a really cool picture here of the facilities um the, the blackened in space there is where we would project that's for the rec right yes so that's where the rec center could possibly be developed um here's a nicer picture yes that's the one i'm looking for so this will this gives you a good idea um of where we can of some of the things that could be done with this facility so there's the projected rec facility place, then you have the hub in the back, and then the other place is the current Elks Club that they're looking at doing some renovations, doing a restaurant and a few other things. They do have a current um, childcare facility there for kids under the school age group. So they do have that. So that could be an opportunity for us to work with them to develop that um, infant childcare um, you know, that the city would like to see happen. Um, depending on what happens with the golf course and stuff, there's thoughts of, you know, this is some stuff that the hub has had drawn up on different field possibilities on what could be out there, as well as I think they put an outdoor tennis court someplace, didn't you? Yes, I'm gonna zoom in, because this is very exciting. Um, we also do have two members of the hub leadership team here to answer any specific questions you might have about this. But this is, uh, a really lovely diagram of the potentials that they see out of the site because it is over 130 acres, 30 acres um, of potential land use. Which will not only create a space for us for indoor space, but also a ton of outdoor space opportunities. And I think there is some bike paths that are already going to it or through it. So it'll create, a, create quite a recreational opportunity uh, right within the city. Right. Um, so, to level set, if people don't know where this location is, I'm going to zoom back out. So, uh, this is the roundabout when you're headed towards Barry. Um, so, this is where the bike path goes, or the Seven OAV multi use path goes right by here. Um, and this is where the train tracks cross um, the bridge here. I hope that orients folks to where we're talking about. So, this is currently the Elks Lodge and the golf course. Um, here is a slightly zoomed in space also, so you can see that um, you, the white building would be the space that the hub is um, sort of reserving, putting on reserve for potential exploration from the city. Do you mean to steal your thunder, Arnie? No, you're doing good. <laughs> doing good. It's all about it's all about a team effort. <laughs> um, so the new option that kind of came out when, like I said, Cameron and I kind of jumped on board late because we had heard through the grapevine somewhere that this group was working on this and we're like, we should have a meeting. So the hub plans on moving forward regardless of the city involvement. Um, they, they have plans on, again, doing what they're trying to set up with their tennis um, slash pickleball facility. Um, but they thought it would be kind of a great opportunity and we can't agree more that this would allow us to centralize um, many services and, you know, between recreation classes, soccer clinics and other opportunities um, right into one area. Um, 
and we can also, I didn't write that down, um, but we can also use this as a, as a space where we could really grow. Um, there is there is a lot of fee, uh, land up there. So if for some reason, you know, 30 years after I'm gone and something something else comes up, you can say, hey, we can actually build on here and create additional opportunities. Um, you know, I, I look at things, you know, when we're talking about buildings and projects and stuff, I always look at things in kind of 50 to 100 year plans because we want stuff that we build to be here long after we're gone. The rec center, I think, has really lived its course. Um, it was a great facility when the city got it in 1969, I believe it was. And I believe they bought it for $25,000 from the United States uh, uh, military, which is a great deal for the military because they don't have to renovate it. Um, <laughs> but. Um, Right now, we're at a place where something has to be done because that it's just not an accessible building. It's been great for me because I have to run the stairs every day. Um, but for folks that do have access issues, it is a real it is a real um, challenge. The other thing with that space, too, is that if we even could have youth basketball games in there, there's no place really for parents to watch, you know, so it's it's very limited. But uh, option three is is a very exciting option. Uh, I mean, I really like option two as well, but I think option three does give us a, a an opportunity to really work with another group in the community that we could create a really outstanding facility. Um, and on an offer the folks that live in the capital city, you know, some great opportunities. Um, the one thing that I think is really important in Vermont and I, I can say my kids aren't crazy about winter, <laughs> you know, is to have an indoor space where people can walk because a lot of your seniors cannot be out on slippery sidewalks um, and places that, you know, dangerous footing. And just in general, to have a place where people can walk and meet and hang out, it's an opportunity to create a real community center, which I kind of feel like we should have here, you know. It's just Montpelier is a wonderful place, and that's the one thing we're we're missing. So I don't know if there's. Um, I I would highlight a couple oh. different things about. Um... Yep, I will highlight a couple different things. I I think. Yes, um, I want to highlight some of the other benefits of looking into this option. Um, you know, the land right now is zoned for recreation, and I think that there's a pretty good. Um, uh, hmm. I think it would be wise for us to continue to look at what that means for the future of the city if we were to consider purchasing that land. Um, even if we aren't able to build something there, what does that mean for the city? I think that um, some of the other uh, benefits really would be that par private public partnership, because I, I, I think that the uh, programs that the hub are offering or saying that they want to offer are really uh, great and expansive and some things that the city just can't do. Um, and they, we are able to do things that they wouldn't be able to do as a private entity. So it's a really great way to explore sort of a symbiotic relationship there that we don't really have um, currently. Uh, we didn't really touch on the fact that we have no idea how much this would cost. Um, uh, <laughs> at all. Um, we can assume, I think, that the building cost would be about the same as the one we were quoted for um, at our rec center, because we are we still want all the things that we'd want to put down at the rec field. So we could probably estimate five to seven million dollars for that building as well. But that doesn't include all of the field opportunities. It doesn't include what we would need to do to support the hub and their work. So there are some risks inherent in a private public partnership when it comes to investments. I also want to highlight the fact that it's it's not in a walkable location. It's very close to our bike path, but the bike path does not get to it. And if you walk that bike path in any regularity, you know it ends right before the roundabout, and then you're left on your own to cross a busy bridge. So um, that would be something we would need to investigate. So just wanted to make sure those were mentioned. And, and that could also create some opportunities with us, us with the schools to see if kids wanted to come up there after school to have them bring a bus up 
and drop kids off. So that could be an opportunity of another partnership. So I guess I'll, I'll yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I do wanna make sure that we are um, calling attention to the fact that all of the options that we just threw out to y'all um, really will require additional public engagement. We aren't dictating any of the plans. We've just been brainstorming on the needs that we understand the community is, is communicated to us, um, that we've heard from y'all that are very important um, uh, you know, priorities for you. Um, so we still need to go out and get more engagement. Um, if we hear from you tonight, or if you say you want more time to think about it, what you what options you're interested in us continuing to work towards, um, we'll certainly turn that around and talk to the public more about that. We also don't have formal site plans and construction contracts. We've been working with Breadloaf at the hub has been working with um, Black River Design. And so there's a couple different options there. We don't have any formal site plans other than the renovation option. Um, and all of these will require bond funding of some variety. Uh, we don't have the budget to absorb a five to $7 million project. So those are all just considerations to take in um, mind, keep in mind while we move forward. And so our real ask of y'all is to just look at the options that we put out and um, really give us direction on what you would like to see staff put their energy and capacity towards. Um, you know, we do recommend options that have a new building attached to it. We really strongly feel that our building has outgrown its capacity and we are interested in um, a new construction. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so I, I'd like to at least just start with questions from the council. And then I know that there are probably some folks from the public who would like to um, either also ask questions or, or weigh in on this. Um, so we'll start with just, just questions from the council for now. And then, um, then we'll go to the public. Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, and then sure. Donna. A great presentation. Um, never felt like totally good about putting the kibosh on the old like indoor swimming pool idea with the jump and splash folks. So I'm wondering like if we had option three, maybe now is not the right time, but would that open the door to the future maybe? Reopening that conversation and maybe looking at an indoor swimming pool up there as well? Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, Donna. Um, I didn't see a place where you were describing the hub services. Are they talking about specific programs or did I just miss that? Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm going to pull up the map again on the screen so people can see what we're looking at. Um, Actually, while you're doing that, this might also be a good opportunity. Um, I know uh, Ethan Atkin is here. If you would like to say anything, um, I want to give you the opportunity to jump in. Um, if not, that's okay. <laughs> oh, but you, you should you should either come up to this mic right here, or you can come have a seat at the table. Hi, I'm Ethan Atkin. I'm the chair of uh, the board of, of the hub. We've been working on this for about a year and a half. And um, uh, when we got far enough along in our plans that we were fairly confident this was something we could move forward with, we felt. Uh, it would behoove us to inform the city about it. And I talked to the mayor and uh, we talked to Arnie and Cameron about it. Uh, basically, what we said was we're not asking for anything from the city, but we want to inform you that this is a project we're, we're working on and you should be aware of it because it we we think it's going to be a huge asset to the community of Montpelier. Uh, we talked to uh, Dan Groberg at Montpelier Live. He was immediately recognized this could be an economic development project that can attract businesses and residents and possibly even make somebody think of building more housing in town. Um, wouldn't that be a shock? Um, so uh, that's sort of the, the, the quick background of how we got here. and. Um, both Arnie and Cameron sort of immediately recognized that this is really a generational opportunity. Uh, I would be delighted to answer any questions that anyone has either here or individually later. I did 
have an opportunity to speak to a couple of council members. And, uh, but in direct answer to your question, um, I think Cameron has brought up sort of the picture of what we're, what we're planning to do is uh, retrofit the uh, old Elks Lodge and put, uh, put in a restaurant, perhaps a brew pub, uh, with a, a bar and um, a, we look at that as more of a social center and so we're calling this a recreational and social center uh, because we think that as much of what we're planning to do has to do with the social community social act, act, activities as it does with the recreational activities uh, so we would have game rooms there we would have uh, uh, social activities every weekend and in the evenings and in the summer. Uh, we do have in our plans at some point to consider putting in an outdoor pool. Um, we're thinking about trying to design it in a way that if at some point it could be converted to an indoor pool, it would be designed that it would have the capacity to do that. Uh, these are all sort of future plans. Our immediate plans are to uh, we're uh, talking about putting in some of these uh, virtual golf um, machines or whatever they're called, um, which are extremely popular. Uh, we understand from the property owner that they do not intend to uh, continue with the golf, the nine hole golf course there. So that opens up uh, all of the flat land up there, which is about 40 acres. Uh, the rest of it is um, pretty steep and could be great for walking or uh, or biking, you know, bike paths or or, or hiking or whatever. Uh, we also so our our plan is to have you know s social activities like um, you know chess night or knitting night or you know felting night or which would involve both instruction and ac activities. Uh, children's storytelling, uh, book readings, you know, you name it. I mean, any, any uh, ex tempo can come up there and do their, um, uh, uh, whatever, whatever that is, storytelling. Uh, outside, uh, so next to that, we're planning to build a, what we're calling a sports bar. And that would uh, uh, enable us to have uh, indoor tennis courts, indoor pickleball courts, indoor practice area for soccer, for uh, ultimate frisbee, or any other activity that people might want to do indoors. We, we're thinking of putting a, a climbing wall inside. Um, and, uh, and then outside, we would also, we, we intend this to be a year-round facility. So we would have outdoor tennis courts, outdoor pickle courts, platform tennis, uh, disc golf, a mountain bike pump track. Um, cross-country skiing, which is already set up up there. There's a, apparently the best sliding hill in all of Montpelier. We might put a rope pole on that because it's long enough to, to accommodate that. Um, there's a lot, it's also right on the river, by the way, the land goes on the river, so you can put a, you know, a canoe launch or a, a kayak launch down there. I think the, there's already a plan to do one a little further up the river, or is it up or down the river? I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, the bike path that does end just at the property, they're now planning to have it circle around and come back around the property. So uh, this would be, uh, you know, for nine, well, eight months out of the year, seven months out of the year, <laughs> uh, would be very, very accessible by, by bicycle or by um, multi-use, you know, rollerblading or walking. Um, and then we're just open to any other ideas that members have. Uh, we intend this to be a membership based organization so people will pay a general membership fee uh, to join the hub uh, if they want to have access to what we're calling the specialty uh, recreational activities they would pay an additional monthly fee we want it to be very accessible that you know um, two dollars a day basically would be the general membership uh, we are also planning to have a after school program. This won't happen immediately, but uh, where the schools that are interested can bus the kids there. Uh, we would have a uh, educational tutor who would work with them on their homework for the first hour, do the, give them a little bit of training on whichever recreational activity they were interested in, and then leave them free to play until their parents get out of work and come and pick them up. 
So that's a real quick overview, and I could I'd be happy to answer other questions. So the Elks Club is going to go totally away. I mean, who owns the land? So right now, the, the property is owned by City Properties, which is a partnership with Steve Ribellini and uh, Alan Lendway. Uh, they have been extremely cooperative with us. They have indicated that they're open to the possibility of selling the property. Um, and they are, um, uh, the Elks Club, when they, they bought the property five years ago uh, from the Elks Club, leased it back to them for five years. That lease expired in uh, February of this year. And uh, uh, after that, they, they shut down the, the lodge and um, city properties did try to run the golf course, the nine hole golf course this past summer, but they weren't, they have no plans to do so in the future. So would the hub be buying parts of the land that you're talking about using and then opting for the city to buy some and it's going to be a patchwork or so a lot of this is still up for discussion yeah. you've heard ethan just say a lot of things that also included some services that the city already provides and so those are opportunities that we'd like to investigate um, partnering with right and so we'd provide a service they'd provide a service ours would be you know free or reduced for the community their prices now the hub still is a, a private membership only so um, to talk about the land purchase none of that has been decided so to be part. to be determined okay great. sure uh, jay yeah so as we as we think about a potential partnership with the city um is, i'm curious if there's a business plan and some support and or some sort of financing outlook to, to develop the hub and that so that we can understand that we're, we're we're comfortable with the longevity of the of the prospect of of the initiative which i'm super excited about but i'd love to you know learn learn more in the details especially around the financing yeah um also you know it's a work in progress if you will uh, we have a business plan we have a financial plan um we uh, are in the process of negotiating to get a loan to build the sports barn. And um, we're raising money right now to come up with our 20 or 25% that we need in order to get the loan. We're about a third of the way there at this point. Um, and uh, so our, um, we, we feel quite confident that we'll we'll be able to get the financing together but until we have it we don't know for sure yeah okay any other questions from the council then i want to go to the public yeah go ahead jack obviously this is you've been working on it for a year year and a half it's still early but do you have a timeline of what what you anticipate well when, when we uh first approached uh, cameron and arnie we thought that we might be able to get this uh, to open around this time next year. I think that's extremely optimistic at this point, um, but uh, we have not dropped that as our possible opening date yet. Um, but I would not be surprised if it did take longer than that. Thanks. Fair enough. And so I, I do want to highlight that that mention in the presentation that their plans are sort of going along your regardless of ours. Um, uh, you know that space if this is an option that you're interested in pursuing could be it's a very flexible space and um, is different than the building that they're looking at so the timelines don't have to be congruent. Fair enough. Uh, Lauren go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, overall, I'm very loud, sorry. <laughs> um, like, I think this is really exciting and seems to be pursuing um, and better understanding the options and how the partnership would work and those details. Like, are you anticipating that we would continue to explore the pool option as well, just knowing that there's, you know, unknowns and financing and permits and everything that need to get lined up for the hub project? So is the plan um, if council indicates this to look at the two offsite or two non current rec center options um, so that we have choices and like what would that entail is just the 
architectural design getting what would be the next phase of that? Um, yes, I, I think that that's really important that we keep both of those options open. I think um, working with an architect would be very similar for both buildings of what we're looking for. Um, there might there's more space at this option for sure, so that does change things. But the next step would be um, finalizing that design and getting community feedback. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Just an answer to to our schedule. Can you introduce yourself. Uh, I'm John Ray Hill with Black River Design Architects okay. and a tennis player. Um, <laughs> and uh, just a little history as to where we arrive at this pretty exciting moment in time. We, as people know, our tennis facility got shrunk up at First and Fitness when it was sold, and we're down to one court, which doesn't meet our needs. Hence the interest in playing tennis in the winter. And we looked around and only we couldn't find any buildings that were of adequate size, didn't have posts in the middle. And uh, we couldn't even find any flat land that had parking. And then uh, when we looked up at the Elks Club, which was changing hands, uh, we looked at all this parking. There's 200 spots there, and the Elks were in bu busy. They would have 300 people there for a big occasion. So the parking was there. It's a flat site. And we had another athletic activity, golf, that we could cooperate with. So Ribellini and we got together and we were going to do locker rooms and share those. And the sharing was a, a great aspect of this because everything was half price um in terms of the renovations and uh we were very excited about that we had our building designed on the left hand parking lot and then all of a sudden uh capital soccer was very interested in outdoor fields and we asked Ribellini about the possibility of reducing the size of his golf uh facility and he said it's awful flat out there <laughs> which was to us a, a positive response. And then two weeks later, he announced that he's not continuing the golf as it is. So just as we thought we were all set to go ahead, all these opportunities are exploding uh, and it's all good, but it's not helping our timeline. <laughs> <laughs> so we have redesigned the building to be on the east side of the existing instead of the left, as you can see. So when you come in, we're not blocking the access to this amazing site. And if people aren't golfers and haven't been up there, it is just an amazing open space. And to think that there's that much land in Montpelier, it's, you only see a few houses. Uh, it's just astounding. So do take a trip up there. So we've moved our building away from the access to this whole, um, flat area and it has the same relationship and then the idea of putting leaving a space for the city's needs they're all sort of around a central hub and we talked about you know some of the possibility of sharing staff and having a central place where you register and can we do it with punch cards and there's seven million details to work out but the possibilities are have exploded in terms of our original needs and so we're delighted to partner with the city because there's lots of things that we don't know anything about that uh, there's room for. You know, we're amazed that the bike path didn't go to anywhere and now it goes to a big recreation center. There were plans apparently to have the bike path come along the back of the golf course. That'll fit in very nicely. So it's, it's really uh, all falling together conceptually yeah. and uh it's not helping our timeline but but the potential really is as ethan says it seems like it's a once in a lifetime opportunity that's sort of coalescing thank you yeah go ahead connor and then i want to go to um the public yeah go ahead you, th you think a nine or 18 hole this golf course <laughs> fastest growing sport in america <laughs> i should say that w the, the the thought on golf uh just golf well, I, I'm, I'm, I shifted topics. I'll answer your golf. The, the thought on golf is that we offer a different golf experience. They've proven that the nine hole uh, doesn't work for them. And there are too many other courses around that are better. So what we're talking about now is a much shorter putting green, pitching green, indoor, so that you could go at lunchtime and play golf rather than committing your whole Saturday. 
disc golf's another area where we're, the potential is enormous here because from what I understand, if disc golf can play on through the woods and on the open, so uh, if you're a disc golfer, we could use your help in designing that course. Sign, sign me up. <laughs> so it, I once think the again, drawing is 18 holes, right? Uh, uh, the, that, the, the, the 18 holes is the disc golf course, yep. but. Uh, right so there's, golf, yeah. once again, it just right shows the potential. And it'll be out there with a killer rat. Yeah. <laughs> our our plan is to make this a net zero uh, facility, so it's going to be very well insulated, and we have a, a huge roof that's ideally suited for photovoltaics. And uh, uh, Alex Bravakis is helping us with the, uh, the the solar installation. It's got some funding uh, ideas, and uh, we'll be talking to Kate as well since she mentioned she's uh may be able to help us great all right so i want to start with uh, folks who may be here in person um anyone who's with us in person wish to either comment or ask a question or um, anything like that okay not seeing anybody um anyone online have a comment or a question yes vicky go ahead oh and we've got to get you unmuted here she should be able to. You should be able Sorry. to. Unmute. There Sorry. you go. Um, I'm I'm concerned at the two dollar a day thing. That means sixty dollars a month. That's prohibitive for those of us that are on fixed incomes. Hi, Vicki. I just want to point out that that is the private side of this public private partnership. So. We're, what we're basically proposing as one of the options is to um, co-locate a city building, which would have the same low cost uh, community recreation programming next to this private service, which would have more things that you could do for a fee. So, so the, the hub itself is a private business that wants to open a recreation type center um, that is private and co-locate that building next to a public building that's run by the recreation center. So um, that comment would be sort of for that, that private business that wants to open. So we, we as the city wouldn't have, if we entered into this very seriously, wouldn't have any ability to influence their pricing structure. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes sense as long as it doesn't become um, a haves and have not situation that makes sense thank you yeah the rec department is Arnie can talk a, on it. because so. that is a, a very definite thing that's going on now in montpelier yep. is the haves and the have-nots and it's not pleasant yeah thank you and uh your your point is is well taken I'm, i want to speak to that further um after the public comments time uh, anyone else um, with us virtually wish to make a comment? You can either use the raise hand icon uh, under reactions, or you can uh, turn your camera on and wave, or um, just simply unmute yourself. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. So um, actually, I want to jump back to, well, actually, I have a couple comments. I guess I'll, I'll start off here. Um, I'm very interested in the potential for a public-private partnership uh, with the hub. I think that has a lot of um, really exciting potential. And I, uh, I was, I mean, I've, we've been having this conversation um, over some months now. Um, but one of the things that I was kind of surprised, I guess, about with this was that uh, the city might have its own building. I guess I had envisioned the city partnering with an existing building that you know maybe we were helping to subsidize some of the costs because you know thinking about vicky's point of uh, wanting to make sure that what we are offering as a city is accessible financially to everyone and i realized that that may mean that all of the hubs services may not uh, be included in that package but then I want to be really um, careful and intentional about what is included and make sure that those are um, uh, things that we've identified as a as needs you know you know at the beginning of your presentation that you we had 
listed some um, some activities. So that's going to take some conversation. And I mean, I mean, if it also means that we are needing to build our own building um, up there as well, then um, so be it. But uh, let's. I, I, I'm interested in, in all the possibilities there, even if it doesn't mean we have our own building. But I'm I'm saying that in a, coming from a place of ignorance um, and knowing that there's a lot more conversation to be had. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So if I could just follow up on that, Madam Mayor, um, that, that clearly is an issue. I just point out that um, both the rec department and the senior center for years did rent space from First and Fitness, so to use their pool, to yeah. use their tennis courts, those kind of things. So we envision a situation where just because the facilities are there on the private side of the thing, you know, this, the city could rent tennis courts for lessons or that are then part of, you know, our program that then the public can have accessible. They're still getting their hourly rates or, or whatever. So it's, it's sort of going both ways, you know, that's how the ice arena works, for example. Yeah. And, um, so it's not, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean just because this is the private side doesn't mean the public doesn't get to use it. It just means we have to work those details out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have other thoughts on the other two options, um, but I'm gonna save those for now. Other thoughts from council? Oh, there, okay. Oh, it looks like we have some comments from folks online. Uh, uh, Colin O'Neill, go ahead. And I think you- There we go. There we go. Can you, Good. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Colin O'Neill. I grew up in the area. Um, I think this is an amazing opportunity I also um, manage the Wrightsville Recreation District, which is a, um, it's a special district where we combine the uh, budgets of four towns to spread that financial burden. And, you know, so I see a few potentials here to really build the greater central Vermont community, you know, not just focusing on Montpelier, but bringing in, you know, more of the entire, at least the entire U32 school district towns. Um, so we're inviting all of those residents to use this facility. The location of it is phenomenal for it to service all of those towns. And then by doing it as a district, you're able to assess a per capita fee to all of those towns to help with operating costs. And if I recall correctly, I think that this, that concept was in Arnie's plan four years ago for the Elm Street facility, I believe, to, you know, to spread the burden and the benefits to uh, a, a greater area and really strengthen our entire community and not just focus on Montpelier. It's a good point. And uh, John Odom would probably want me to ask you um, where you live. Well, right now I'm recovering <laughs> uh, from surgery, living in Montpelier. Okay, but, I, so, but you're in Montpelier. I, Great. <laughs> That's all yeah, but but I, I mean, I, so I, I grew up in Montpelier, East Montpelier, Middlesex, Plainfield, and I'm the outdoor recreation director at Norwich University, and I run um, Wrightsville. Thank you so much. Um, and Vicki, I'm going to wait to, um, but thank you. Um, well, I'll, I'll come back to you in a bit here. Um, Comments from council. Thoughts. Go ahead, Donna. I have some questions about Elm Street. I got really excited about that. And I don't want to leave it in the dust. I, I would propose we spend some time there. And it's good that you're thinking about the building being the same in, in either place. I may have missed it. Did you mention how many floors? Um right now that's still Right now, that's still up in the air um, because if we can possibly spread the building and not need an elevator, that could you know save some cost in the overall building. Um, but we haven't ruled that out to do a, a second floor, at least around the gym area. We probably wouldn't have a second floor over the gym, I wouldn't imagine, the, the uh, big indoor space. Okay, and I, I guess uh, along with that, if indeed, as you're sitting around the table with all these wonderful ideas and the focus goes to the Elks, previous Elks Lodge property and the hub, go back to Elm Street and think about those bathrooms. I got very excited when you talked about year round heated bathrooms, that maybe there's a way to do something there, whether it's the current 
pool house or some other smaller structure with solar panels, heat pumps, something that we can do and not lose what we have in that rec field and still mm -hmm. build it up. Thank you. Okay. Other comments from council. Go ahead, Jack. Very interesting ideas that we really hadn't thought of when when uh, when we had the presentation for the renovation of the uh, of the rec building. I thought it was a very attractive project. I thought it looked really good, um, and I I totally get where you're coming from. That one of these other options is likely to be a better option for the city, and I I definitely think it's worth exploring. Um, I, I do think the fact that both of these uh, other sites would uh, expect people to to drive there is is a negative. You know, I understand a lot of people play basketball at lunchtime over here on Barry Street. Streets probably less likely um, in either of the other locations. So that's that's something to consider. On the other hand. Um, Knowing what my background is, I see, well, the uh, recreation center, if that is no longer used for recreation, have you done any thinking of whether that's it's feasible to uh, keep the building standing and convert it to housing, or uh, is, it, is the thinking that it's uh, bad enough that it really can't be maintained? Um, there's a few options that we're looking at. I will say that as for a city facility, the the abatement and the ADA accessibility costs are a majority of the costs for renovation. So if we did keep it um, and didn't renovate it, we would need to have that kind of conversation of what you'd want to see in there. I, I'm not, to, obviously those conversations are new and need to be on the table. Um, uh, it is a very old, unaccessible building, though. So um, it's one of the reasons I think we also talked about a little bit in the negatives of still looking at that option is that the abatement cost, the more we looked into it, the higher that estimate kept rising, right? I think that $5 million was uh, really low, honestly, when it comes to um, uh, what the actual cost would be. But I think that it's wide open of what we could use that for and construction costs have not gone down in the no last they have years. not <laughs> <laughs> observed that never so true other uh connor and then lauren yeah sure so i go back to strategic planning there and i mean jack was adamant in that like what kind of city do we want to be in the future like is eight thousand a right population is it ten eleven thousand and, and as i was thinking about that it, it it does feel a bit short-sighted to look at the current location, just like you guys are saying there. Uh, there's very limited room to expand there. And it, is it just the right now answer or is it the right answer? I, I don't think it is. So, you know, one thing I can put to bed in my own mind is I'm going to flip-flop from my position a couple of years ago. I'm really glad we had this extra time to think about this and get new ideas on the table because I thought that was acceptable, but it wasn't exciting, right? Um, so, so having these new options, you know, and I, I sat down with Nat from the hub today there, and he, he's a great guy, uh, got, got me kind of kind of jazzed about the new option. I, I have concerns like everybody else, you know, the public-private partnership gets a bit dicey, I think, the devil's in the details on that. Um, you know, we, we don't want people paying for services that they're not paying for now. I, I mean, I think that has to be like a list of principles we don't have to adopt if we went into something like this. Uh, we don't know what the budget is, right? Um, and, and the transportation, I think, is an issue, although I wonder if that could be, you know, something we could bring my ride into the mix maybe a little bit, try to beef up the ridership on that by this. Um, so, like, long story short, I, you know, I, I'm excited enough to keep looking at it. And, like, I, I do wonder if one option on the table in the near future, it sounds like we're probably pushing a bond vote off to, like, a year from March. Would it be possible like this March to have sort of an advisory question on the ballot if there was a direction we felt we should go? Because I think that would force the public input and give a timeline. 
and force the hub and ourselves to get more community involvement. And sure enough, if they shot it down there, well, you don't want to put a bond on a year from now. So it gives us a clear direction that we're going. So just a thought there. It's always a possibility. Also a reminder that there are uh, there's a November general election next year that could also be a bond vote. I should have remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> what is he inferring? <laughs> You'll be too busy running for senator, I know. <laughs> um, Lord. Yeah, thanks. Um, I definitely I agree with what folks have been saying. I think it's worth exploring both of the new ones and think it it kind of changes what the conversation we had a few years ago with new opportunities. Um, I, you know, just thinking about the ability to expand and grow, I'm thinking like in our strategic planning, there was an idea of a BIPOC community center, you know, things like that, that we don't have space for and we wouldn't in the current building. So being able to think about, you know, what are some of those center and community gathering things that we've, um, you know, put forward and would love to see movement on. Um, so would love to explore that kind of opportunity. Um, you know, and I, I just echo Connors and I'm sure all of us will be very conscious and, you know, just what what kind of agreement could we lock in even with the, you know, very, you know, well intentioned, wonderful people working on it now, but you know, it gets bought by a hedge fund down the road and then, you know, what have we locked in for the city? So um, just wanting to make sure that the the values of accessible, affordable, and that, you know, we're a built we're able to um, continuing offer offering everything we do now and growing and expanding that. So how we would set up that agreement would be really important. Okay, hey, uh, uh, Vicky. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go back to to Vicky and then to Ethan. Okay, go ahead. There. Um, okay. Um, something just came up on my screen. Anyway, I wanted to thank Jack for um, his comment because that was basically what I was going to say. Is the current recreation center? Um, you know, maybe it could be uh, repurposed into affordable housing or a homeless shelter or a drop-in shelter or something um, combined on that um, because we desperately need something. And that is perfectly situated in town uh, so that you can actually walk there if you're in town. Um, and also, I just wanted to put my vote in for if they're going to be any place, anywhere, um, where the Elks Lodge was, because it's closer to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Less driving. I don't like driving on Elm Street. <laughs> too many traffic, too much traffic. Anyway, I would really like to see, even if we had to actually take that building down, if we replaced it with some really affordable housing, not just affordable in terms of, you know, lip sync and, and a homeless shelter. We really need one of those. Um, I mean, I, I do work with a lot of the homeless and I know a lot of them. And, you know, on these cold rainy nights when you're tucked away in your bed and you're thinking of somebody who's not tucked away in their bed, it's tough. So that's just my two cents, thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, right, go ahead, Ethan. I just want to address the comment about uh, a hedge fund. Um, <laughs> the the hub is is a uh, uh, although it's being called a private, it's not a for profit uh, uh, organization. It's a, it's a five hundred one seven seven B. Something. It's not. A, it's not a five hundred one seven three. It's. A, I think it's a five hundred one C seven or it's. It's. It's a non five hundred one C three. No, it's a five hundred one C seven, which is a nonprofit organization that has a purpose of being a social or recreational center, and so it'll be membership driven. It will not be uh, a, a hedge fund. Could not come in and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so for now, uh, Arnie and Cameron, do you have the direction from council that you need? I think so. Yep, we will continue to okay. explore the two new building options. 
and come back with regular updates from what we're doing. Okay, very good. Thank you. Right, thank thank you, you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think we are ready to um, move on to the PFAS discussion, but also wonder, team, if you would like to take a break right now. Yeah, yeah. so we're going to take, it's 7.51, um, we're going to take a break, we'll be back at 8.01 uh, for the PFAS discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, it is 8.02, so we are going to come back uh, from our break. Okay, and we are... Um, we are ready to uh, take up our discussion about uh, PFAS. And uh, for this, we had uh, been uh, discussing um, or wanting to make some comments about an upcoming uh, permit from ANR um, about leachate. And uh, so we had drafted up a letter. Well, actually, I should say really Lauren and Jay worked to draft up a, a letter about that. Um, so just so folks know the order of how um, this conversation will go. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Lauren and Jay, I'm going to let you just speak to what's in that letter or just make any kind of comments you would like to about that. Um, and then Bill, if you have uh, things, I know we have st uh, other staff here as well. Uh, if you have comments uh, about that, I want to invite you to um, to speak to that as well. And then uh, I know we have some folks from Casella here as well. So I'd also like to invite them to come up in, and uh, speak to this as well. Um, and from there, we will go to the public and then we'll go back to council discussion. So that's sort of how I'm thinking about the, the flow of this conversation. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll start with uh, Lauren and Jay, if that's okay. <laughs> sure. sure, I can take a stab and Jay round it out. Um, so, you know, trying to really reflect the, the conversation and input, um, that council had, the um, kind of updates that we got from the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, we wrote the letter that you know people can see on the agenda for today, um, really looking at an approach of you know, wanting to make sure that what we're doing as a city is not just stopping taking leachate and it goes to another community, but instead continuing to work to try to keep on track the pretreatment of the leachate so that we're getting more upstream at the problem. So the um, specific recommendations and actions that we uh, drafted in the letter that interested in you all's feedback on were um, making clear to the Agency of Natural Resources that our city is committed to developing a plan to eliminate the intake of PFAS contaminated leachate and associated releases into our waters. Um, the piece that uh, Jay and I kind of wrestled with some and look forward to your input was adding in a, a deadline of how long we would keep accepting the leachate. So um, we put in as of July 1st, 2023, the Montpelier Water Resource Recovery Facility will no longer accept leachate that contains any detectable PFAS chemicals. Um, we thought this timeline reflected um, what we heard from ANR of about you know, a couple more months, of like, and then about a year to actually get the pretreatment up and running. So we thought in a year and a half there could be pretreated leachate, um, and that the technology for treating it can actually remove um, the PFAS. So if we can um, kind of put that marker out there, that that's you know what we want to see happening. Um, we put in here that we wanted quarterly updates from ANR to ensure to get, you know, mostly so that we can just make sure that this prog, uh, the project is remaining on track. That, um, you know, who knows what could come up, and maybe we'll hear from Casella <laughs> any um, any issues they foresee, or you know how uh, how likely the timeline that we are provided is. Um, but just really give us a chance to kind of stay on top of this and revisit if issues are arising or if new opportunities, because this is such an evolving issue and you know maybe things could move more quickly and um, who knows. So we wanted to build in um, that kind of check-in as we go. Um, we wanted to, um, in the second bullet in the letter, um, 
you know, again, just be doing our part to encourage that this uh, pilot project to pre-treat leachate is moving forward, that the best available technology is being used, um, ensuring that ANR maintains a strong oversight role of the process um, and is really the ones in the driver's seat around determining the technology, testing and monitoring protocols and implementation timeline. Um, we also requested a more robust monitoring um, that instead of being quarterly, uh, we suggested that we would prefer monthly testing. Um, also looking um, into, you know, be interested in what, what all are they testing for? You know, we heard some um, comments about the suite of chemicals. So PFAS is of course of great concern, but there's a lot of chemicals in leachate. So what exactly are we testing for? And also ensuring that um, it's multiple sites and not just kind of one spot um, that the testing's happening. And finally, uh, we put in that Montpelier would not accept out of state leachate, which we understand happens pretty rarely now. Um, but that was part of the permit. And that wraps it up. Jay, what would you? Thanks, Lauren. I, I mean, I think I think you covered all, all of the uh, big picture thinking. Um, the only thing that I would would add here is that we felt like Lauren said, we wrestled with this a bit. Um, was that we felt like the timeline that we developed was um, was some, you know an, an appropriate comp not compromise, but it just felt like it it not only allowed A and R to to um, you know take the lead you know once the once the permit is is um, is granted, but to make sure that there you know that we we did have something of a line in the sand that we're saying like this is you know we're serious about this and, and we're concerned and we've heard from our our, our constituents about um, the impact this has um, uh, on our rivers and and the Winooski watershed and that we're we're willing to be partners in um, in providing enough time to make sure that we can work through the you know the, the pilot project but at the same time we're not going to be passive participants um, in in accepting it so um, we, we felt like this was was a reasonable timeline to work to to move forward and I think also part of part of what we did was build in an opportunity for the council a year from now ahead of you know budgeting for the 20 to 23 24 to be able to make sure that that we, what we didn't want to do is is have our, have the city staff the dpw in particular get caught off guard um and to, to give them an opportunity to be able to plan you know looking a couple of years out to be able to revisit and say okay yes we're still going to hold we're holding to this timeline um we're comfortable with the progress that anr is, is making in the implementation of the of the permit and um you know, now's our chance, you know, as a city to be able to adjust budgeting, et cetera, for, you know, the, the wastewater facility to be able to manage that. So um, we just felt very comfortable with providing not only the state, but also the city to be able to check in and, and, and you know, make appropriate progress on, on what we're talking about. Great. Thank you. Great job, guys. Great letter. Um, right, I want to go to either sure. uh, Bill um, or Chris. I think we just had some minor comments with the, the letter. I don't think, Kurt, did you want to offer some your suggestions? Um, you don't have to, but. <laughs> Can I just say, Kurt, it's good to see you in person. I yeah. was <laughs> for the first time in like oh, two years, I thought. Yeah, it's been a bit. Yeah, I'm going to have to worry about my voice going to robot mode here. digress. <laughs> 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 um, so I'm Kurt Modica, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, so I did provide a memo to Council just uh, providing some additional information. Um, just want to kind of highlight some of the items in that, if that's all right. Uh, one is uh, there's PFAS in the influent. Um, there's PFAS in every treatment plant. Um, it is much higher in uh, plants that do accept leachate. There is a high concentration of PFAS in leachate. So, um, but I wanted to just recognize that um, regardless of whether or not we take leachate from Casella, um, we're going to be having PFAS in our wastewater. Um, <clears throat> uh, one thought that we had is uh, kind of following up on that is, um, would it make sense um, to do a treatment system at the plant rather than at the landfill? 
Uh, there, uh, we did talk to Casella briefly about that. On Monday, we had a call with them. Um, they're open to that concept. It's not really the direction they're looking at right now. Right now, they're looking at on-site. Um, but I was kind of curious if council had interest in exploring that option. Um, it's just something to think about. There's, uh, there's challenges. We can't accept all the leachate right now. In order for Casella to move forward with that, I think uh, we'd have to increase our capacity for um, accepting leachate to that full scale, which would mean probably an aeration tank uh, build out so we could accept more BOD. Um, but it's just one other option that, uh, that you know, that council may want to consider. Um, as far as the timeline, I just uh, I wanted to note that the uh, timeline um, that council's looking at now is really uh, to only have a pilot system in place at the landfill. So, um, you know, in about a year and a half, Casella would have, um, you know, under their permit, they'd have uh, likely just the pilot, which would only treat maybe 10% of the leachate at the landfill. So um, they expect that uh, there's a good chance there would be a reduction in the PFOS through that, but an elimination, full elimination, because it won't be the full scale treatment system installed at that time. Really it's 2025 that they're anticipating because there's you know the permitting um, construction. If you think about uh, the upgrade we did at our plant, it took like three years. Uh, that was a design build project fast tracked um, with kind of known technologies. Uh, the technology for um, PFOS treatment is very new, um, and you know they have to go through a pilot system before they can prove out that it's going to work. Whereas you know, our project was known standard technology, so it is going to take longer. Um, I don't see that it's possible to have full scale PFOS treatment in a year and a half at either Montpelier or or at the landfill. <clears throat> um, and just to follow up on that, uh, complete elimination of PFAS. Casella could maybe could speak to it more, but I'm not sure that um, would be possible either. Uh, I think, you know, getting it maybe to drinking water standards or some level um, in that range could be feasible, but a complete elimination, I'm not sure um, that that's a, achievable, but I'm not an expert on PFAS treatment, and, and these folks do know more about it than I do. Um, and then, you know, just a little bit on the environmental impacts. Um, <clears throat> we're the closest um, treatment plant to the Coventry landfill. If it goes anywhere else, it's, it's more trucking. So I just, you know, just wanted to point out that um, there'll be more emissions. There's more diesel fuel used up. There's an environmental impact to bringing it other places uh, beyond just the PFOS discharge. Um, you know, and then of course there is the financial impact. I think that's kind of, um, you know, not the focus of the concerns, but it, you know, it is real. It's you know, it's probably going to be over half a million. Uh, it will be over likely half a, half a million annually if you consider the revenue loss and then our uh, sludge disposal. So um, our sludge, our sludge has roughly the same PFOS levels as uh, treatment plants that do not accept leachate, but it does have PFOS in it and it all goes to Coventry. And then it runs through the landfill and the leachate comes back to Montpelier. So it is sort of this cycle. But, um, but I just wanted to uh, point out that, you know, it will be a revenue impact. It's, um, you know, there's will be project potential impacts. It would affect the sewer master plan. Um, you know, we'd have to do some thinking about, uh, you know, it, whether it's not rate increases or a cut to projects, but there would be a real impact to uh, what we could do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Questions. Um, Connor, then Donna, and then I have some questions too. And then um, Jennifer. Yeah. yeah Kurt, what would be the benefit of treatment at, at the plant as opposed to at the landfill? I'm not, not sure I understand that. Yeah. So, the, um, well, like I said, all, all uh, plants have PFAS in the influent. Um, so it's not just leachate, it's what's coming down the pipe from all the all the uh, residential users. Um, so we could take out, you know, we could treat all of the wastewater, not just um, the leachate that's coming to the plant. So you get a full, you know, full treatment process. So do we do we know what our level of PFOS is within what because you, you talk about all these different sources. And right now you quoted drinking water level. So there's a standard there. So if we have a measurement now and we continue it, is there a way to say we want this much reduction? 
Yeah. Um, so a couple of points on uh, the sampling and testing is um, there is not an approved surface water test procedure right now. Um, it, it's still new that, that it's just not uh, fully developed and approved. Um, there is a test procedure that's approved for drinking water, and that's essentially what's been being used for wastewater effluent. Um, so, and we do have results from the state. I think um, it was 2019, there was a report put out by uh, Weston and Sansom, Sampson Engineering. Um, so our influent levels based on that report are about 169 parts per trillion, and the effluent was 69 parts per trillion. Um, uh, comparison to Norfield, which does not take leachate, they're at about 10 parts per trillion influent and three parts per trillion effluent. Uh, drinking water EPA standard is 70. So our effluent currently meets the EPA drinking water standard. The Vermont drinking water standard is much less. It's 20 parts per trillion, which we do not meet with our effluent. But we're, we're not making drinking water at the wastewater plant, obviously. <laughs> but well, no, I was just going back to I mean, the statement in the letter that I thought you were addressing was no longer accept leachate that contains any detectable PFAS chemicals. Mm -hmm. So would you be more comfortable with that statement referring back to the drinking water level? Yes, I, I would. I would recommend making that change. And, it meets the, and, me and the Vermont standard is more stringent if the council wanted to um, use that Vermont drinking water standard. Okay, do we we meet the 20 Vermont drinking water standard? Uh, not currently, no. Our effluent is, uh, uh, like I said, it's 69 parts Six, per trillion. I didn't get all the numbers. Yep. Okay. And, and EPA is 70, is 70, but Vermont is 20. Well, I just, I mean, again, I'm just trying to think something that really is reachable. Um, but if we don't meet the Vermont standard, we're trying to meet the Vermont standard. But yeah. we can't do that until this pallet project gets done, right? And there's better treatment. Right. No, I think, yes, we'd either have to um, stop taking leachate or the leachate that we're receiving would have to be um, you know, treated to reduce the levels coming into the plant. So if, if council was interested in um, revising the wording to meeting to having the leachate meet the Vermont drinking water standard levels for PFOS. Um, you know, that I believe is achievable, but you know, I'm not, I think I would defer to Casella. It, it still that. would be a goal, it'd be higher than where we're at. Correct. Okay. And likewise, the date that I heard you, which made sense in the timing of the pallet project, would be 2024, not 23. Um, the pilot project, I think. Uh, and again, I defer to Casella on, on the exact timing of this because they're um, looking at the, the permitting process and everything else um, that would be required to build it. But I believe within a year and a half, the pilot project uh, would likely be constructed. But that, again, only would treat a small portion of the leachate from the landfill. The full scale yeah. build out to treat all of the leachate is 2025, Five, is what 20, they're estimating. Okay. okay. Thank you. Jennifer, go ahead. I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Um, so if if we're saying that we don't want to long term accept leachate, doing this build out seems like a lot for something that we're not going to do long term. And so what would happen with that building or the all the renovations that have to happen in order to take in excess amounts of leachate? What would happen? Well, I think if, if um, there is interest in building a PFAS treatment system at the plant, we, I think we would need or would want to commit to a long-term um, uh, agreement with Casella to accept the leachate. I mean, we wouldn't want to do that type of investment without having a, a long-term commitment. Okay, thank you. So um, this idea that we could treat for leachate in Montpelier, I, I'll just say for myself, it is very interesting to me, especially because we know that there's PFAS in what's coming in anyway, um, aside from the leachate. So I, 
um, if it's, um, yeah, I feel like I just need more information about that, right? Like as a possibility that, cause that's a really, it's a really interesting possibility. Um, you know, if it's just an, an aeration tank that doesn't, I mean, I'm sure that it's probably, you know, like a million dollars on its own, but it doesn't <laughs> sound like a lot. Um, uh, is there any way you could flesh that out a little bit? Like, what does that look like? Well, the, the aeration tank project is probably a $5 million okay, five project. Million, great. Okay. Um, <laughs> the other area we'd have to look at is the UV system um, to make sure that there, that, you know, there weren't issues um, with increasing our receiving and still maintaining our UV. Uh, we haven't explored it because I didn't, I wasn't sure if there are interests um, by council, so we haven't really gotten to any details, but um, you know, that's kind of one of the questions I wanted to bring up tonight. Yeah, Lauren, go ahead. Um, just tied to this line of questioning, um, I mean, is are there opportunities to put in a better filtration system knowing there's PFAS and other contaminants, I'm sure, anyway? on the site that isn't locking us into, isn't tied to the, isn't like accomplishing the Casella pretreatment, but is instead just a better filtration system for our own contaminants. And part of, like we had talked a little bit last time, but I know that there is specific PFAS contamination funding was part of the infrastructure bill that just passed for, for wastewater treatment facilities. So I, like I would hope there would be potential funding opportunities around this who knows, I'm sure that's a competitive grant program and stuff, so nothing we could count on, but it seems worth looking into. I don't necessarily love the idea of locking us in to be the longtime off taker of leachate, but I do like the idea of us better filtering our own system anyway, if that's an opportunity. But I don't know if you feel like they have to be because like of the economics or the volume or something like that they would have to be tied together. Yeah, no, I mean, certainly it wouldn't have to be. It would be an economic challenge, just given the other needs in the sewer fund, you know, CSOs, and, um, you know, there are still some aging infrastructure dealing with the solids uh, disposal. So there's, a, you know, just a lot of other competing needs. It certainly could be done as a standalone project, but it would be a high cost. Interesting. Any other questions or comments for Kurt? Okay. Um, all right. Well, and I know we have uh, some folks from Casella here. So if you'd like to come up and make any comments, you are welcome to do that. Um, and then we'll go to the public. And then we'll, we'll chat. Yep. Just share, just move the mic if you're speaking. If you've been sitting in the back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mayor. We appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Sam Nikolai. I'm Vice President of Engineering with Casella. Uh, Joe Gay is here. He's the engineer for Casella for all of Vermont. Um, Kim Crosby, um, sitting in the back, is our uh, Director of Compliance. So um, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, I guess maybe just a couple of remarks. We certainly um, understand and frankly support the city's desire to move forward with removal of the PFAS. Um, you know, our primary concern is the timing. Um, you know, as, as Kurt kind of laid out um, through the permit and through our engineering planning, we expect to be in the pilot um, by next year. So the pilot will actually 100% um, be operational in 2022, assuming that um, the agency and Act 250 can get, get us the appropriate permits. Um, and so we'll, we'll absolutely see a reduction by July of, of 2023. Um, I'm not convinced that we will be able to get full removal by then because we need time to scale the pilot system up. Um, we hope to do that quickly. We hope that the pilot goes extremely well and the agency will support you know, that permitting efforts. We have no reason to slow down. We have no reason to drag our feet on this. Um, I actually had a conversation with John Casella even today that he fully supports us moving forward as quickly as we can. Um, but I would encourage you to, to, to consider we need a little bit more time uh, than that uh, proposal to get full removal. Um, we're hoping that we can scale up to the full system after the pilot, you know, through 2023 and 2024 and be fully operational by the end of 2024. So by 2025, we're in really good shape. 
Um, I wish I could give you, you know, drop dead definitive deadlines on that, but we're just not there yet. And out of the abundance of, of caution and wanting to get it right, we want to make sure that um, we commit to that. Um, a couple of other thoughts would be, you know, we are committed to getting the pilot running at the landfill next year. We have the option to propose a pilot at the city. That that is definitely an option. If the city's interested in looking at the potential to try to pilot something and, and see how it works, we would happily have further conversations with the city on that. And so that may be a way to sort of step into, is this an option for PFAS treatment at the city? And what does it look like? And what's it gonna cost? And, and all those things. So that's certainly something that could be considered that would have to be worked out over the next couple of months, but um, absolutely it could be considered. Um, but I, other than that, I think we'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody from the council has. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, well, go ahead, Jack. I, I could just jump oh, yeah, into it just for a second. No, absolutely, um, yeah. it's, I think it's important to know, too, that, um, you know, I've been administering to this permit, the specific permit, in coordination with Bob Fisher before Chris was here um, since 1998. We've had a great relationship with the city of Montpelier. Um, we do accept your trash, your waste um, that has the PFAS in it. Um, we also accept, as Kurt mentioned, the sludge that comes in with about the equivalent amount of PFAS in it. Um, you know, we want to continue the partnership that we've had. We've worked really well with the city of Montpelier. We want to continue to do that. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's uh, what's best for Vermonters. Um, Sam didn't mention I live in Underhill. Um, I'm a mountain biker. Um, I, I love the Mamba uh, trail network down here. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it is important it, we take it serious. Um, John's committed, the company's committed. Um, we, you know, would like to partner and continue to partner with, with the city and work forward together, um, you know, with a solution to this. Um, so, you know, we, we do have the permit. We've gone through the permit. We're going to sit down with Kurt and Chris tomorrow go through some comments on the permit. We'll be responding with our own comments and, um, and look forward to um, starting. Um, uh, you know, Vermont is on the leading edge of PFAS research. Um, now, you know, we're gonna be a, a big player with that, especially with the wastewater. And we're engaged and we're committed to, you know, trying to figure it out. Great. Thank you. All right, so questions. Uh... For you all. Um, so, Jay, you had your hand up earlier. Um, so, I'd defer to you first and then Lauren. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to appreciate, um, I definitely appreciate the partnership and I appreciate that there's, um, you know, maybe, the, you know, the timelines don't necessarily line up uh, ideally. I'm curious, part of this conversation, you know, we, we had at our last meeting and, and that in doing research, we, we've come to understand there may be a potential to, for storage, um, where we we can we as a city can commit to not be discharging the PFAS in, into the into our waterways um, even before you know so that that they can be captured and stored in, in whatever state before the the final whether it's end of 2024 or into 2025 before the you know the pilot project has come online and um, and they can be you know pulled out of the legate is is that something that's a possibility how um, can that help us bridge that gap I guess is my question I think if I, if I understand it correctly you're referring to one of the technologies that we're looking at has the ability ideally to pull PFAS out without having to do a lot of the treatment of the rest of the leachate. And if that were successful, then we would be able to pull PFAS out at the landfill and then continue to bring PFAS free or PFAS low, depending on how successful we are, leachate to the city of Montpelier. If, if that may be kind of what you're, what you're trying to get at. Yeah, it's it's essentially hedging, you know, like knowing that the technology might might not necessarily be there yet, but being able to to hold on to that before we're discharging it into the watershed. So yeah. So under that scenario, you know, even as once the pilot is operational, you would see an immediate reduction of PFAS coming you know, to the city. You won't be PFAS free yet, 
Um, but it, again, then the opportunity to take that pilot and scale it up would, would be the, the ideal goal. Just to follow up on that directly. Would, so in theory, if you did something like that at the city plant, could that pull out the PFAS from non-leachate as well? I think that as all the research that we've done, if for the city, it's a different technology. Okay. I, th I think everything that we've learned says that if a wastewater plant's going to, to try to get it, you're going to take all of your existing infrastructure, and then at the end, you're going to filter either with a resin or with carbon um, to remove the PFAS. You, you wouldn't use the same types of technologies that, that we would use for, for leachate directly. All right, Lauren. Thanks, really appreciate you being here and, and getting this information and just credit where it's due. Uh, we did testify in parallel on upstream trying to get PFAS out of a range of project products, which appreciated Casella's support on that legislation and hope we can continue that um, as we all try to deal with the, the downstream <laughs> generational uh, contamination. Um, I guess my question, um, so we heard from Kurt some concern over the the level are we understanding right we had previously heard that the actual treatment if you did something like reverse osmosis you could get it to a non-detect of pfas in the the treated water is that right and is the idea that either you'd be looking to blend in some or that there or are there different technologies you're exploring that would be less clear so when we had been thinking of a you know non-detect level, it would be the the treated is what we'd be looking to ultimately get to for for the city, and we'd just like to hear more about that. Sure. So I would say our ultimate goal is to get all the PFAS. We're not going to advance a technology that only gets seventy five percent of it. The goal would be to use technologies that are successful at, at treating. Getting to zero is always a difficult concept for anything, PFAS, anything else, uh, which is why as a society, we have permits that have standards and, and you, you meet those standards. But our goal is to remove it and we're not going to pick something that's only gonna get part of it. Our goal is to get it all out. That doesn't mean that I can guarantee you that every drop will be 100% PFAS free. Nobody can guarantee you that. But I would say our stated goal is to remove all of it. Um, I would say, in the absence of a standard, you know, ANR has asked us and is, is directing us to remove as much as we can. Um, I will point out that by legislation, they have to have a surface water criteria in the state of Vermont by 2024. They don't have one today, but they have to by, by legislation. So by the time that we're fully operational, there will be a standard that will apply to you and to us and to everybody else. And as mentioned earlier, too, um, for, even for drinking water, the standard is 20 parts per trillion, not zero. I go ahead, Lauren, and then we'll go to Donna. Just one um, other follow up. Do you know yet? I know you're still working through the pilot, like what percent you anticipate would be going through the pilot program as you build it? I mean, do you have any estimates at this point? how much leachate we would test through the yeah. pilot we don't we haven't settled on it I, I, we estimated that we were going to be in the 10 to 25 percent range but i'll be honest and say i don't know yet we will know in a few months but we're just we're not quite there yet thanks donna so you partly answered one of my questions right now you're saying you don't know exactly what standard you'll be at until you're into the pallet project. But yet you said you felt very clearly by 2023, there would be a decrease. So you would just be guessing on what you've read about the treatments of what that decrease would be. And I'm asking because I'm, I'm really working for a, what I call a true statement that if we can ask for a standard that is reachable such as the drinking water standard or the federal standard by 2023 or another standard by 2024 so i'm, I'm trying to be reasonable here uh, it's i would say um 
I'll say it this way, our, our goal and our understanding of the technologies is that those technologies are designed and will remove the vast majority of PFAS out of what's treated. Why I hedge in the reduction part is mostly based on volume. We just won't be treating all of it by that point. We think what we will treat will be as close as we can to non-detect. We just won't be treating all the volume. And so that's why I, I'm concerned that we can't say to the city of Montpelier, we're gonna bring you no PFAS in, any, in our leachate by 2023. Does that, does that help? Okay, so and likewise, if we treat it on site, you treat it on site at the landfill and solid waste plant treats it there, would that, because that would also cover all the stuff that comes from our homes. Would Correct. that get closer? If uh, I would say that, it, again, it would be a different set of technologies, but the goal and the expectation would be if you treated at the plant, that you would be treating all of it and would be trying to get as close to zero as technology as, allows us to do it. Okay. And Kurt, I have a question for you. Do, do you know now how much comes from our homes and how much comes from the landfill? Is it separated that way? Any, any way to separate it? Yeah, well, we don't have, um, we don't have exact numbers, but we just have a, a comparison to um, the wastewater plant in Northfield which does not take leachate. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, it is, um, the majority of it is, um, is in the leachate. I mean, yes. The, yes. Probably, you know, almost 90%. 90%. Uh, you know, roughly in the ballpark. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Um, I have a follow-up question. Um, Also, not sure how to word this. Um, do so. Well, so a couple things. One is, um, are you, in your view, is it sort of an either or in terms of if the city treats it, you all would not, or is it sort of a if, um, is there the possibility of both? I, I mean, to be fair, that's I, I think it's an either or uh, just based on, you know, I'll let Sam chime in, but I think just based on the, the, the sheer cost of what it's going to be to put a full sy system in, mm -hmm. um, I think it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, Kurt, would you, would you agree with that? Okay. For, for the leachate. Yeah. Um, and as a separate question, um, if we, uh, I mean, you, you all have mentioned like, yeah, you're committed to uh, treating the PFAS. Um, I'm, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, does that commitment extend beyond whatever we decide uh, to do, or is it dependent on our decision to take leachate or not? We were committed to removing PFAS from the leachate, period. Period. Um, we're, we're hopeful that not only in the short term, but in the long term, we can continue the partnership with the city. Yeah. And, and one of the technologies that we mentioned would be most viable to pre-treat and then bring it to the city. And then in that case, you would be looking at a potential long-term opportunity to work with us. Yeah. Um, but but yes, I think in answer to your question, we're committed to the removal one way or the other. Okay, great. Thank you. That's that's good to know. Um, Lauren, go ahead. Just on the technology, so you were describing one that it seems particularly designed to remove PFAS. Does that address other contaminants or is it really like somehow attracting the PFAS chemical or something? Like would we be getting leachate with... Um, is it do different technologies? Are you assessing them by the a broader suite of contaminants, or just really focused on PFAS? The the one technology that that I was referencing that focuses more on the upfront is based around the idea of foaming, 
which PFAS likes to do. So it would primarily get PFAS. It will get some other contaminants, but there would still need to be substantial treatment after that. So that's the need to continue to bring it to the wastewater plant. If you, the alternative, of course, is looking at RO and RO, you're going to get clean water out the other side. It's going to treat everything. Um, so obviously there are differences in costs and how those are those are handled. But and RO being reverse osmosis. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think we've heard it from others, but just from the horse's mouth, if, if we didn't take the lead sheet, where would it go? Yeah, so so that's one of my responsibilities for the company is um, <laughs> to uh, have uh, contingencies upon contingencies upon contingencies, like the landfill does itself. Um, we have redundancy built in there for for for, for the environment. Uh, in this case, to answer your question, we are permitted to go to Plattsburgh, New York, Concord, New Hampshire, Franklin, New Hampshire, um, and now with this permit amendment, uh, you, it would be you guys. Um, so if you guys said no. Plattsburgh, Concord, Franklin. And certainly we're gonna to continue to explore more options um, uh, to be able to treat it. But uh, for, for since I've been with the company since 1998, we've had essentially um, five locations where we've been able to take leachate. And I'd like to speak to the New Hampshire out-of-state leachate just for one second. I, it does sound like you've made up your mind that you don't want it. Um, I just wanna offer that um, I have two landfills I'm responsible for, one in New Hampshire and one in Vermont. And the leachate primarily goes to Concord from the New Hampshire site and primarily comes here for the Vermont site. Yeah, but there's times, Chris will call me up and say, you know, we've got something going on, we're, we're, we're upgrading and we gotta be down for two weeks, I can't take your leachate for two weeks, which happens. Um, it's really not that uncommon. So uh, I'm in a, in a role where I need to be able to say, okay, I've got a place to take the leachate while the plant's down. So it goes to Concord. The same thing happens in Concord. Concord goes down for whatever reason, and the New Hampshire leachate needs to go somewhere. If you know, there's more limitations in this permit, so it's going to be a little bit more problematic down the road. Um, but I would call Chris and say, Chris, can I take two loads of Coventry, Vermont leachate, and two loads of the New Hampshire leachate um, to get us through the period that Concord can't take it? And in the past, we've been able to do that. So it, it's an, it would be unfortunate if we weren't if we didn't have that provision. It, it, to do that and it's very rare but it it does happen from time to time does, go ahead. does the same happen in vermont are we down and we need to go somewhere yes <clears throat> how often once a year twice a year um so we're going to plattsburgh um a lot we've been to plattsburgh a lot this year with some of the plan upgrades and so forth uh, i don't think the vermont leachate's gone to concord at all this year and i don't think the new hampshire leachate is has come here at all this year in, in 2021. I don't even think it happened in 2020, to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, it's very rare, but it does happen. Um, and it just provides some flexibility for the operations um, of, of, of these landfills. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. I was just curious, is that um, landfill going through the same pretreatment technology or is the Vermont one like the trial pilot? project vermont is really <laughs> leading the northeast if not much of the country with um you know moving forward on this so uh, new hampshire has done some testing but doesn't yet have the the um, framework in place to um, to consider what are going to be the standards and how how that's going to be treated landfill or not landfill Great. The wastewater plants are regulated very differently, too, between the two states. Uh, Jack. I don't know if you'll have the answer to this question. Uh, when uh, Peter Walk was here uh, last week, I asked him this, and he thought it was just too imponderable or whatever to really give me an answer. But I'll try it with you guys, too, because you're actually handling the material. If Montpelier just said, stop but we're not taking any more we're, we're like go, we're looking at two different possible courses of action one is we take it you know subject it to conditions and limitations the other is just say forget it we're done which one of those not for montpelier but for the whole 
system, water system of Vermont and the region, which one of those would be lead to a better long term region wide outcome? I'm not sure I understood the question. <laughs> Can you? I'm, I'm yeah, not sure. the idea is that uh, <clears throat> whatever whatever happens in Montpelier is not going to change the the fact that there's PFAS in our wastewater and in the uh, and in the uh, solid waste stream. So, what's the best way to? reduce and eventually eliminate the uh, chemicals from the, from the waste stream and, and from the environment. So Lauren actually mentioned it earlier. When, when the emerging contaminants were first identified, we and a lot of other people said the, the very first thing we've got to do is stop producing this material. The landfills and the wastewater plants are at the end. They're the sinks where all this material is, is ending up. And as long as we as society keep making Gore-Tex jackets and, car and fabrics and carpets and everything else that's got this stuff on it, we're going to be producing it. The good news is um, you've got a voluntary ban in place in the U.S. You've got manufacturers stopping using it. And you've got um, documented blood levels that are dropping. So I think 98% of all adults in the United States have detectable concentrations in their blood. That's the bad part. The good part is the chart shows that those levels are dropping each year. So the more material we stop using, the, the less this stuff is produced, the better off we're gonna get. Unfortunately, all of us, including you and me and everybody in this room has got carpets and fabrics and jackets and everything else sitting in their houses that are gonna to have to be dealt with over the next 20 years. And so it's gonna take some time before we are able to resolve it. But the positive thing is that we're on the right path. We just gotta keep moving it forward. And as people's uh, blood concentration is going down, I assume that's because uh, over time it's being excreted. And so that winds up in our wastewater and <laughs> going through our sewer plants again. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And presumably, you, we've got, again, no fault of companies, but we have landfills full of this stuff that's going to take years to process, too. It doesn't just all. So even if we're completely stop in production, we've still got decades, probably, of stuff to process. To get to Jack's question, I'm going to try to see if I can frame it just slightly differently. The it, I think the question is, which, if Montpelier were to simple. The choice is Montpelier keeps taking it. You work pro program you're talking about. Well, we just say stop, and you have to figure it out somewhere else. Between those two options, which of those would result in the best overall, not just for Montpelier, but the overall environmental outcome? And or is that impossible to answer? Is that, is that what you're trying to... That's exactly the question. Yes. So the. the... The practicality is if Montpelier stopped taking it tomorrow, it would primarily go to Plattsburgh. Um, it, there are opportunities in Concord and in Franklin, but for the most part, it would go to Plattsburgh. And so it's the same watershed. It's, it's going directly eventually into the, the same Lake Champlain watershed. So the only thing that would change in the short term is we would be carrying leachate further, more diesel being used, more trucks to a, a further endpoint. So from that standpoint, it's, it's a worse outcome for the overall environment. Now that's not an argument to, to keep the status quo. Right, we all want to see this stuff be removed. We all want to proceed forward, and we fully support that. Uh, but in the most immediate short term, the only thing that changes is we're hauling leachate to a further location with more emissions, and it's costing. You know, people will say, "Oh, it's costing Casella." It's not costing Casella. It's costing Vermonters in every waste that comes into the landfill. Does that? Uh, hope that yeah, helps. and you know, I wanted to follow up if I could on yeah. that. Um, one of the concerns that was expressed by 
a state official, I can't remember who it was, was that the that Vermont, because of Vermont is on the leading edge, um, if, if you were to take it to Plattsburgh or New Hampshire, their requirements aren't as stringent as Vermont's are right now for discharge of it. So would you have the same incentive to continue doing the pretreatment that you're talking now if you were not being required to do so in those other states? I, I heard you say we're committed to doing it, but what would your time ch frame change or don't you want to not answer that in public? I get that too. But... <laughs> our, our commitment is to, to remove it. We don't view hauling leachate out of state as, as any kind of acceptable long-term solution for, for Vermonters. So um, we, we expect that um, we're gonna work through this process. We, we expect that it's not gonna be easy. We, we, the technologies are, are not as proven as we would like, or in some cases, the, you know, and ultimately, even these technologies, they're separation technologies. All we're doing is pulling PFAS out of leachate and getting it in some other media <laughs> that has to be dealt with. So all that has to be shaken out. But, our commitment is to move that forward independent of um, how things you know um, addressed in Montpelier. Having said that, as Joe pointed out, we've had a long relationship with the city. We would love to see that relationship continue and us to be partners in removing this. Thank you for answering that. Thank you. Uh, Jay and then Donna. Um, I think your point is very well taken and I appreciate the, the impact of, you know, of, um, what it would mean to, to ship it out of state um, in the scenario that if we decided tomorrow not to take it anymore. But I think that's exactly why we proposed um, uh, to stop taking it about 19 and a half approximately, you know, a year, a year and a half from now, not tomorrow, um, because we want to keep this we want to be in a position where we're keeping this process moving forward and that you're incentivized to find to to develop this pilot program and to look for alternatives so that you know you're not we don't want to paint you in a corner that's the last thing we want to do we, we don't want to just say hey that's it forget it we're not taking it deal with it because we understand what the environmental impacts of that would be we also don't want to be you know, putting these PFAS in, in our waterways. I know it's the same watershed, but we're, we're talking, you know, in our backyards, in, in, in rivers and streams that our kids are playing in on a daily basis. So I think that that's why we, we felt it was a very reasonable, but also motivational time frame to establish where a year and a half from now, that's, that's when we would do it. It's not just tomorrow and, and, and you're stuck, but there's, there's motivation, um, uh, an opportunity for you to work towards better alternatives. So I just wanted to make that point. I appreciate your points in that you you know you it's got to go somewhere, right? And and you know it, it, it's not a solution that you can just obviously if we could if it could have been figured out overnight it would have been, but it's going to take some time. But at the same time, we have a role to play in what we're willing to accept in in our own in you know in the watersheds that that our um, that our community you know engages with. Thanks. You know, you, you mentioned earlier uh, the idea of asking A&R for regular updates, and I would offer to you, we will provide updates on whatever frequency you would like. If you would like us to come and at the same time or at separate times, Joe and I are happy to do so and, and tell you what's going on. How's your progress? You know, how are we meeting these goals? We'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Donna. Uh, I do think it is quote, our purchase, our waste in the landfill, it's ours to deal with. So I really want to work with you and the pilot project. I really want us to push our agency of natural resources. I think that's the one who we're really directing this letter at more than you, um, because they have the resources to help us do this and do it better continuously. And if indeed we keep 2023 I would see changing some of the standard in that sentence, we could then modify it at that point and say, okay, this is where we are. Where can we be in another year? Is that hard for you as a business? If indeed we're reviewing this every year and then saying, okay, we're going to do it for this year, but we're going to ask for this much change and this year, this much change. 
Is that too tentative for you as a business? Could be. <laughs> it depends on the, the, the results. I, I don't think that's an unreasonable ask. I, I, I think that as long as, as we have the ability to come to you and say, hey, this worked really well. Oh, this didn't work really well. Yeah. And you know, we have ups and downs and you're willing to work with us on that. I would say we support that. Again, we're, we're, we're being transparent here in our, in our desire to, to move forward and be successful. Um, if I could tell you exactly what number that I could meet, I would, <laughs> so that we all could be comfortable with it. Okay, we, because likewise, I don't see us, I see us just leaving it in the landfill. If we're not doing part of the pilot project, it's not being treated, it's not improving. So we don't have any chance. So to me, to be a partner and be part of the pilot project to me is working towards a solution and not just dumping it further down the road so thank you, thank you. I think it's um, uh, worth to an extending an invitation to come up and get a tour of the landfill. Uh, we do that to all the council members. I think it would be uh, very helpful um, and uh, worth your time. Thank you. Uh, all right, any other questions uh, for these folks for now? Okay. All right, thank you. And we may have further questions even later, but but uh, appreciate your uh, taking the time. This was really, this was very valuable. Um, and so at this point, I wanna to turn to the public. Um, I'm gonna start with folks uh, in person, though I'm guessing that there's nobody from the public who would like to make it. Here's to be city or Casella staff. Yes, here, here. <laughs> or my mother. <laughs> Another person. Yeah. That's okay. That's my mom. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, my mom came. <laughs> I, yeah, mom, do you want to comment? <laughs> no, okay. Great. All right, just checking. Okay. Uh, all right. All right, so virtually. Um, uh, yeah, any folks will wish to comment? You can just wave too if you would like to. Okay, uh, Daryl Bloom, go ahead. Thank you, thank you for letting me speak. I, I'm mightily impressed by the depth of the questions and the information and the participation by Casella and the mutual goals here of uh, protecting the waterways and the people who drink them. Um, I really appreciated the letter as it is drafted. Um, the fact that you were asking for uh, tight oversight for the pilot project seems excellent to me, and uh, the increased monitoring. I do have a couple of thoughts that I'd like to add. One is that it seems to me that I, as far as, as much as I can, I understand that this is not the time to set standards for the levels of PFAS in the water, and uh, that standards are expected from the EPA in a year or so. Um, but it would seem to me that it would be wise to have parameters, points at which the um, ANR would say, oh, that's too high, and that then ANR would have an action plan for what to do when the monitoring said, that's too high, whatever it would be, if it was the EPA standard for drinking water or I don't know, but that that seems to be an ANR responsibility to say what would be too much and to have a plan uh, to say, what do we do if it gets too high, um, either from the leachate or from the, from the discharge. And then the other thing that has been referred to, and I'm sure it's being worked on, it's just not being talked about at this meeting, but I couldn't resist commenting on the need for ANR to be working with whomever is the right party to figure out how to hold the sludge, store the sludge, until we know what to do with it. Because that seems to me that it's foolish to send it back to the landfill it's an opportunity for those little buggers to squeak by us. Um, and 
we don't know what to do with it because we don't know how to break this chemical down yet. So I am just advocating that it seems to be somebody should be looking for the, uh, a way to store the sludge. And that I don't know if it would be appropriate for that comment to be a part of your letter or not. Um, those are my those are my comments. Thank you for letting me speak. And I'm Daryl Bloom, and I'm a resident of Montpelier. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else virtually? Can you hear me? I'd like yeah. to speak. Go ahead, Nat, and then we'll go to Shana. Oh, thank you. Uh, am I uh, can can I be heard? Yes, you can. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> There are two things in my mind. One is that uh, there are some uh, jurisdictions who have opted out already. There used to be Newport, and I think there used to be Essex, and there may well have been other communities that have opted out of of the leachate program. Uh, am I right on this or wrong? That's accurate, but uh, carry on. <laughs> So uh, do we know why? Do we know why they d decided to stop taking leachate? Is there a narrative here that we need to pay attention to? So that's a question. Um, in some ways, I think uh, this meeting should include, and maybe it does include, and maybe those maybe the uh, the uh, Agency of Environmental Conservation, or whatever it's called at the moment, maybe they are in the loop. I don't know that they are in the loop. But the people who are working on uh, withdrawing those chemicals from the marketplace need to be a part of this discussion and, and need to be, uh, we can't just deal with it on the leachate treatment side. We, we've got to deal with on, on the marketplace side. And uh, the imperative has to be clear. And the energies need to be connected. I don't know whether I'm making a point that's being understood. I hope so. Um, I wonder, here's a third question. I wonder whether the affected communities drawing water from the Lake Champlain uh, watershed or from Lake Champlain itself. I wonder whether those communities are made aware that uh, they are sending communities like Montpelier are sending this stuff through the eco ecosystem into the, into the Lake Champlain watershed and possibly affecting the health of people who are drawing water from that watershed. Is there a connection there as well? So these are these are at least three concerns, and thank you for um, uh, inviting me and others to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Nat. Um, did you want to answer any of those questions? I, if not, that's fine. I just have, I wanted to wait till Nat had a chance to to say his piece. If you if you want to address it, great. If not, that's okay. Um, I guess the the, the only a uh, comment we, I would add is that um, historically uh, leachate um, went to two locations of Vermont, uh, Newport and Montpelier, um, and uh, to a much lesser extent to um, several other facilities which were served primarily as backups. Um, it no longer goes to Newport um, because of an Act 250 determination, not because of an a and r nor a city of Newport determination. So that's the only change that has resulted in leachate no longer going to the city of Newport. Uh, the permit, the former permit, also allowed us to take uh, one load a day to bury uh, with a very low BOD limit. Um, and the, um, the size of the tankers now didn't warrant us to go there. 
So we, we just let that drift off of the permit. Uh, Essex uh, Junction was another facility. Uh, they lay in the pie their sludge and there is some concerns about PFAS. Um, we don't even take leachate to Essex. And, and, and so that's the issue there. Uh, the city of Burlington also took our leachate um, and uh, we collectively with the city of Burlington opted out only because they don't have the storage infrastructure for the leachate for storage um, to be dosed into the system. So those are the reasons. Thank you. All right, uh, Shana, and then I'm going to go to the bathroom. Don't want any of you to go. I'll make it quick. I'm um, okay. having computer no problems, so apologies. Can you, can you guys hear me if I'm on yes. my phone for audio? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, my name is Shana Casper, uh, District 2 resident, Team Montpelier, and Community Action Works um, and co facilitated the, the National PFAS Contamination Coalition. Um, I also just wanted to raise attention to the fact that the EPA released data yesterday that suggests that, you know, new tox data for two PFAS that show that they're extremely more toxic than previously understood, which could trigger a really drastic reduction in what is considered acceptable amounts in, in drinking water. And so the EPA report shows that PFOA and PFOS were found to cause health problems at thousands of times lower reference doses than um, previous known. And the reference dose is the, is the maximum amount of a uh, chemical that can be ingested, but that doesn't in result in an increased risk of cancer or other, other health disorders. And um, the EPA, uh, you know, forwarded the science to its science advisory board for review. And if they agree, that could really lower the federal health advisory limit for these chemicals, um, you know, 14,000 times. Um, in Vermont, you know, we already regulate lower than the federal government for our drinking water protections. And we're regulating, you know, six PFAS in our drinking water. And the most common testing methods for drinking water in Vermont, so EPA method 537, and the draft method of 1633 for surface water do test for more PFAS. Um, these are 40 PFAS compounds. And so standards are coming, and we don't want our standards to be in the way of that, as we've been talking about. And thinking for, you know, for Montpelier testing, we could look at what, um, you know, cumulative of, of those PFAS, um, of kind of what we would be seeing as appropriate risk for that. Also, just wanting to note that there's, you know, $8 billion in the infrastructure bill that just got signed on Monday for small-scale water systems, as has been noted. And I also kind of want to echo what Donna has said, is that I don't, I don't necessarily, I'm just like raising all these as points, but that doesn't seem like there's really a decision to make. It seems like we've got a letter written by the city to ANR, and it seems like there is general consensus around it, say for some small changes around the testing methodology and um, this letter calls for, you know, PFAS relate and calls for encouraging the state to move quickly and with more oversight on the, um, on the, on the, um, on, um, on the um, monitoring and, and oversight on the, on the implementation of the treatment um, technology and, you know, want to call on the state to up their oversight and, and do more monitoring and to move forward with, um, you know, pilot projects. I just want to make sure that as we're kind of raising all these different issues and having a lot more conversations that we're not getting too distracted by the signing and the sending of this letter from the city. So just wanting to, um, you know, voice, voice my uh, encouragement and support for that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, anyone else? And I'm going to I'll be right back. Anybody else in uh, in Zoom land who is uh, trying to be recognized? I'm not seeing any hands up. But I want to make sure everyone who wants to be heard is heard. Okay, we'll go back to council, uh, Donna. Well, I, I just want to, particularly Lauren and Jay wrote the letter. If indeed there's any openness to modifying the sentence about the July 1, 2023, 
uh, will no longer accept Lishi that contains any detectable. Is there any, do you have any give on that statement? Are you willing to modify it? I think that's where we are. Yeah, Council, I'm, Council discussing uh, the language and what so we I'm asking. should adopt. Go ahead. Um, I mean, one thought, so part of what I heard this evening is there's different technologies that get a different level of outcome, like reverse osmosis is more expensive, but you get a cleaner product. If I don't know if this is true, but if our standard is pushing towards adoption of the better technology, um, where you know, and maybe there's a one part per trillion or something that gives some of the wiggle room that, that like zero is always hard for for anything. But um, I mean, I I do the study Shana referenced and stuff. I mean, I think those standards are, the EPA ones are really high. I think the state one, I think all of this, as we learn more, it continues to be either worse than we thought and the standards keep going down and down and down. So I wanna be both realistic, keep us on track, but know that these chemicals are just, the more we learn, the worse they are at really low concentration. So I don't wanna to set too high a standard um, and, you know, I mean, I could see if we're able to take, for example, pre-treated reverse osmosis water that's come out the other end as part of this, then maybe we're able to live up to that and it's a portion and then some other portion is going elsewhere in a year and a half. So I'm, I'm open to other people's input, but if we're able to um, encourage better technology that gets to lower output or cleaner water. That's my motivation of trying to keep stick really tight on. <laughs> yeah, I was just asking that within the year that they're gonna have, and part of that is starting the pilot project, if indeed you would accept something closer to like the Vermont drinking water standard just for that first year. And you can say no, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, Jack, go ahead. I'm curious, and I'm glad the guys from Casella are still at the table because I'm curious. I heard you say, well, reverse osmosis system can get you to essentially zero. Um, if, if we were to say, well, you have to get to zero, and the only, and you, from your perspective, know that the only way to realistically accomplish that is to do a reverse osmosis system, which I gather is a lot more expensive. Would you then make the choice to say, well, we can't afford that. We will continue on what we think is a, re a reasonable and realistic technology path. And if that means we can't uh, take our leachate to Montpelier, then we might as well send it to Plattsburgh. I would say our goal is to find the right technology to get us as close to zero as we can, because ultimately a full scale system is going to be millions of dollars of capital. And to Shana's point, it's likely that over the coming years, the standards are going to continue to change. We're going to find out more information. So we're not going to be in the rat race of getting to five and then having a standard drop and then get to three. Our, our goal is to find the right technology to get the PFAS out. My hesitation about the 2023 date is mostly, if not entirely, volume, not concentration. We don't intend to somehow select something that's only going to get partial treatment. It's only about our ability to treat the volume of leachate in that time frame. Um, yeah, I, I think it's clear that the, sta the standard is going to be lower. And you know what I what I'm envisioning is that detection capabilities will be 
become much greater. So the standard, standards we're going to see maybe parts per quadrillion, <laughs> right? That's that's the way these things go, right? Uh, I my own uh, perspective on this is that I I like the idea of a standard or a deadline uh, and maintain the pressure. Um, but uh, there are a couple of ways of doing it. One is to say, you know, if, if, you're, if we're creating a, a deadline or a deadline that you're saying now, it's just not realistic that you're ever gonna get there. I'm not sure that there, there's a point to establishing that as the, as the deadline. Um, and so it might be better to have a farther out deadline while also reserving the right to uh, get out of the contract if it doesn't appear that uh, adequate progress is being made. And obviously the alternative is to say we're going to establish a deadline, but we'll, uh, we'll kick it out if, uh, if it looks like things are going well and they, uh, they just need more time to meet it. Either way, I think that we'll want to have some some flexibility in it as as we see how the how things progress. I'll just state the obvious that you control your own destiny, and you will in six months from now, and you will a year from now. Mm -hmm. So you have the ability to to say something to us at, at some future date. I, I, we're just trying to convey to you that today I don't believe that I can tell you that we will get 100% of the PFAS out by July 2023. I do understand the goals of wanting to send messages and, and convey a desire by the city. Fully understand that. But from a practicality standpoint, we won't be there by July of 2023. I don't believe. I have a bunch of thoughts, but go ahead, Jay. <laughs> Just put myself in line. Uh, um, uh, all right. Um, so I, my inclination, I, I, I absolutely appreciate Shana's comments and, and your feedback, and, and I appreciate that we can have a, you know, it feels like we have a shared goal here, and I appreciate that we can collaborate on this and, and um, Try to find the best best path forward. My, my I have to say that my inclination is to um, to not waver on a deadline, um, but to acknowledge that if there is a moving target, that it's around what the standards are. And right now, the best standard that we have is what is, in my opinion, is you know the Vermont standard, which is 20 parts per trillion for drinking water. Correct, um, which is different than the EPA standard. So to Donna's original question is. I, I would prefer if we're if we're going to try to sort of quantify this is that we we hold to the deadline, but we use that as the best available standard now. So July 2020, July 1, 2023, then that would be what we'd be willing to ex, uh, accept. But knowing that that standard, as you know, as we're learning more about the impact um, of these, and as we're you know, you're more. Mo developing technology to move us towards a, you know, a, a level of zero that we, we still hold the deadline, but we use that as an, at, at that point as an acceptable, um, uh, acceptable, accept, sorry, acceptable standard, but knowing that we could revisit that standard, not the deadline. That's my two cents. It sounds like we're moving towards the direction of some kind of agreement, um, which I think is encouraging. Um, I, I appreciate the distinction between either um, we're messing with the, the deadline or we're or e, e, one variable is the deadline, one variable is the concentration, right? Uh, and um, you know, one of the things that I heard through this is that uh, Vermont's is either Vermont or the EPA is going to have to have some um, 
surface water drinking, or I'm sorry, surface water standards by 2024, which is not the same timeline that we have been talking about. Um, you know, one, so you know, my, my thinking had been, well, what if we um, say that we, you know, we'd like it to meet whatever established surface water standards come out in 2024, that's the goal. Um, or if we keep it for, uh, but, or in the absence of that, then we go to the Vermont drink, drinking water standard. Um, if for whatever reason, the body that doesn't, that, that's supposed to put out those standards doesn't, um, that we have something to fall back on. But that would be a 2024 thing. If we keep 2023, um, you know, having some standard, whether it's the Vermont drinking water standard or the EPA standard, I think is fair. The more strict one seems good. The, um, the question I would, what what I could picture happening as a result of that is that we would potentially, because it sounds like it's it's really a question of volume at that point, like how much we would be taking, right? Because if you're uh, substantially treating a small volume, then it's sort of like how much <laughs> how much else can you add into that to send to us? And is that a truckload's worth? If it's not a truckload's worth, then it wouldn't be worth sending, I assume. Um, that's math that I, I, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't know if that's even a fair question to ask you, would that even work out um, to be worth sending to Montpelier at that point? Um, I don't know if that question is clear. Well, I, sure. I think I think we would uh, send you a truckload if you would, if you would okay. take a truckload. We'd give we'd send you a truckload. Okay. The, okay. the, per, the permit the permit allows for sixty thousand gallons a day, yeah. you know, irrespective of the pilot study. It's sixty thousand gallons a day, which is not all the leachate that we produce. Okay. Thank at, you. At times, that's helpful. Um, you know, one of the things that I also really appreciate is that you all are committed to doing this regardless of what we say. Right? In a sense, that takes the pressure off of us. You know, when I think about Jack's question of like big picture, what's the best for the environment? You know, in part, it's like, well, they're, they're going to do this work regardless of what we do. Now, to be fair, you know, I have faith in the state of Vermont and I like our 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 standards, um, and so I, I want to believe that uh, there's still some value to us um, having that pressure. Um, and being a part of the the dialogue and the relationship with a and r and with uh, Casella moving through this um, there there's one other thought I had about this um, oh, this is a little bit of a, a minor detail on the broad scope of it all, but uh, in terms of testing, um, I think it may I, in the section that asks that we uh, would like to have monthly testing. I think it makes sense for us to um, have both upstream and downstream testing, um, both of those, because it, it's it's really a question of um, you know what what are we adding at that point, uh, based, or like how effective is um, is this for our community? And in part, I actually kind of wonder if it would be worth doing, I, I would, it would be great to have that testing done now so that we have some kind of a baseline mm -hmm. so that when the pilot kicks in, we'd be able to compare it and see like, oh yeah, it is, it is dropping. Um, this is effective or it's not. And we can reevaluate. <sighs> Sorry, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, another thing, um, <laughs> by putting it out to 2023 or 2024 or whenever, um, this council would still have an opportunity to revisit that if for whatever reason, um, you know, circumstances change where we, you know, want to either tighten things or loosen things or whatever um, works. So in a, in a sense, anything that we say beyond this, uh, <laughs> beyond our terms, right, is um, aspirational. Um, and that's, that's fine, but I think that, that, that's still okay. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, last thought uh, between the prospect of having a sort of an in-house treatment versus treatment at the um, landfill. If it was an 
either or you can't have both my uh, inclination would be to have it be at the um, landfill because um, so much because 90 percent of um, the leachate that we're or, I'm sorry of the PFAS that we're processing uh, comes from the leachate and one of the things I'm interested in is um, uh, exportability I guess of like if if you all can prove that this works and is a good system and other landfills decide that they also want to jump on board, then that's a potentially um, an easier model to um, replicate than one that came off of a much smaller uh, site like ours or, you know, we're not treating as much PFAS. Um, if anything I've said in there is not accurate, <laughs> I welcome correction, but um, so there was, I, I just said a whole bunch of things. Um, curious for further thoughts. Yeah, Jay and then Don. Well, just, a, just a minor thing is one, one thing that, you know, Lauren and I talked about, um, and maybe we could have been a little more specific, but we did include language that said um, the testing, while would be more frequent, would also happen, um, we said at a variety of sites. And so the implication okay. would be that it's not just like, you know, 10 feet downstream from where, from where the water, from where it's being released. So we could add, we, we could very easily set a variety of sites, including upstream and downstream um, from releases from the treatment plant. So, yeah. so anyways, yeah. Uh, Donna and then Jennifer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I felt you were leaning to 2024, and I'll just put it out there. I don't think, I think I'm a minority. I lean to 2024 just because of the pilot project and what, we, what we've what we heard around the other standards coming out. At that point, we would know a lot more to go to the next step. But I also heard that the, I do think eventually we'll have to treat that 10% that's happening now at our plant. And so if we don't start it now, we start it later just cost more but maybe the techniques way better but yeah, but we do have that 10 percent we still have to deal with on point. at our plant and then uh, uh, it hasn't been talked about except in the discussion with casello but the statement here no longer accepting out of state I, I do feel that may need to be tempered and so i wondered if there's a way to say um, not accept any regular out of state or only emergency out of state. I think our plant itself has to sometimes take things out of state, go somewhere else. And so if we're doing it again, only on those exceptions, and maybe you can give us some language of what that would be, I think we need to tone that to go because we also sometimes need that exception. Okay. Uh, Jennifer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jen, do you, do you, you, you can go. <laughs> um, thank you. I appreciate y'all being here. This is probably not the easiest thing for you to do. Um, I have a very strong feeling about this, and I am just going to keep it to myself because I think I am the only one who has a, this strong of a feeling about it. But I would like to just personally defer to y'all's letter. I feel like you've done a lot of work and a lot of research and I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate that you want to kind of hold firm on some things. So that's all I'm going to say on this. I'm not going to say anything further, but thank you for being here. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Lauren and then Jack. Yeah. First, on your monitoring suggestions, I just emailed some suggested language for that paragraph okay. um, that, so it would just read, uh, getting to the paragraph or the sentence that I made a change. We also urge a broader suite of testing for likely leachate contaminants, including and beyond PFAS chemicals at a variety of both upstream and downstream sites around the wharf and baseline testing as soon as possible so we can better understand the impacts of the pilot program as it comes online. Oh yeah, great. Okay. Does that address yep. what you were yep. trying to? Mm -hmm. um, 
And just on the timeline and standard, I mean, I, I get, I would rather stick with 2023. I think we can revisit. I think part of what we're calling for here is a regular check-ins with ANR. Appreciate Casella's offer to be part of that and keep us updated. So I think, you know, the future council could adjust, um, but just keeping us on track. It's already a year and a half of continuing to, you know, take this. Um, you know, if we're going to do a standard, if we if people aren't comfortable with the the non detect, which would mean that we were just able to take basically the pre treated small volume that had gone through the pilot, um, which could be one option. Um, you know, and, and maybe if if we want to go that route, then I, you know, maybe we said it like one part per trillion just to give a little bit of You know, just getting to zero for anything's hard, but um, I mean, alternatively, I, I guess I would say the state drinking water standard would be the other one if people aren't comfortable with both 2023 and non-detect or one part per trillion. I mean, personally, I'd love to see it a combined 20 parts per trillion for all of the PFAS that are being tested. I mean, we very well, it could be, which is not our drinking water standard, to be clear, so we're testing for more. But knowing how concerning these all are, that could mean that our test is showing 400 parts per trillion of AP fast chemical. It just doesn't happen to be one of the five that our state has regulated due to lack of um, scientific data, even though all evidence points to, um, you know, concerns at least about all PFAS in the class. So that's one thought that is more protective. Um, we'll be testing for it anyway, so we could tie it to, you know, the, the EPA standard, the monitoring that's going to be happening anyway. Well, team, I think we need to make some kind of decision. Um, Jack. I move that we set the timeline at, uh, keep the timeline in 2023 and set the standard at 20. Parts for trillion? Yeah. I don't know if it requires a motion. We're just kind of discussing it, but <laughs> yeah, just, we can, just we can to discuss get it moving. It. Yeah, that's good. It's <laughs> good. Um, is there a second? And that would be with the updated language that Lauren yes. included. Is there a second? second. Okay. All right. So Jay is seconding. Further discussion? I really want to hear what Jennifer's really saying. I know. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not directed towards anyone. You know, it's it's a cultural thing, and what we have done to this planet breaks my heart. And so the fact that we even have to have this conversation is really hard for me. Um, and just thinking about what's going on with all of our water systems all over the planet, and um, it's just a it's a hard conversation to have. And I don't think. A lot of people think about it when they're shopping and when they're doing their lives and you know I have small kids and you have one coming and you know we're, we're leaving a huge mess for the next seven generations and it and it's very hard so I'm not angry at anybody in particular it's just it's a hard place to be in as a I couldn't agree with you more yeah to be honest I couldn't agree with you more in fact you know, if you just look at the genesis of the line landfill, there are the reasons why we have a line landfill is to protect the environment for those reasons. Right. Um, now, because we have to collect that wastewater, which is a good thing, mm -hmm. right? At least we can capture it. It's not going into the environment willy nilly. We can control it and manage it. And what we're talking about tonight, yeah. it's it's it's. I think we are trying to all work towards the the right goal, and that's to, you know. Um, and have the safest drinking water as humanly possible. Yeah, I and mean, we're, we're in a, between a rock and a hard place and we put ourselves here and that's that's the big picture that is the hard thing to swallow, I think. Agreed. Jack. I was gonna say this earlier and I, hearing what Jennifer said, I, I agree with everything you just said. And uh, this, is, this is a problem that's not a Montpelier problem and we're not doing this to uh, say we don't want this in montpelier water we're protecting the uh, environment 
for the whole uh, watershed that affects the whole state. But I bet we're they're not having this debate in city council meetings all around the state. I bet we're the only ones because we're the ones who have the uh, have the plan, and so we're like responsible for doing what we can to protect everyone's environment. Yeah, come on. Yeah, so probably not like directly to the motion, but are we just having a general chat? Yeah. <laughs> 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 was a motion. Was a motion the, yeah, I'll leave it to you. So like, uh, <laughs> first, I, I want to thank you guys for coming in. And I, I think it does put my mind at ease to know the direction you're coming from. And I, I also want to say to the, the, the wastewater plant guys, we're probably putting you through the mill on this, but like, <laughs> in, in, in my mind, you, you walk on water, treated water, but like, uh, so it, it, not, none of this is like, um, none of this is criticism. I, uh, but I, I just want to be honest, though, I'm hanging by a thread to continue taking this, right? It's. Uh, I, I want to profess I'm a bit ignorant on the science, so when you talk like parts per trillion, a lot of this is going over my head. What worries me is like, okay, we hear the, you know, the uh, levels are different or much different in Northfield as opposed to our discharge place here. Um, I, I, I think we have to ask the question like, okay, we all consume this, you know, we all have a responsibility to do this and we should be accountable towards it. But are we putting residents of Montpelier in our region at disproportionate public health risk by being the one discharge point in the state for all of this? Because I don't feel we're responsible for the leachate coming out of New Hampshire. I don't feel like it's the rest of the state. And I, I think what I'm grappling at, and probably everybody is, is, okay, what's better for the environment overall, you know? And what direct responsibility do, do we have for the people of this community? Uh, whether to take this or not? Because I'll be honest, you, you feel like you're a bit of a sucker, the only ones taking it to the state. Why did everybody say we're not taking it? So um, I, I'm worried about even putting like a deadline a year from now to reassess this. If it comes back a quarter from now and it doesn't look good, I want to be able to say no thanks, you know? And again, it's no criticism to anybody. Everybody's working in the same direction on this, but when you're the only ones doing it, you, you ask the questions, right? So I, I don't know if anybody's telling me we are not putting our folks at a disproportionate public health risk by having this one discharge point. If, if I'm wrong on that, I, I'm happy to learn more, and I do want to continue being educated on this, but I mean, that's the only conclusion I can come to in my head at this point. Thank you, Connor. No. Yeah, so you guys, you, we whatever you need to do, uh, we certainly support. I've given this a lot of thought just as our role as manager in, in, in the community. And unfortunately, in our society, um, and particularly with waste management, this is kind of how it goes. You know, the, the town of Coventry is taking the, the waste from the entire state. And, it's, and they've got a risk. And I don't know what the deal was for them, but that's what happens. And they get the trucks coming and, you know, someone has to take this. And for better or worse, we have the infrastructure to do it and to do it safely. And, uh, or as safely as it can be done. And we're trying to get it done more safely. So I, I respect whatever decision we make, but I think it's important to recommend that we don't think twice about sending our trash to Coventry and the folks up there that deal with that. You know, when someone else takes, you know, hazardous hazmat stuff, you know, I don't know who's taking all the batteries and all that, stuff, you know, I mean, someone's taking nuclear waste, right? So um, different places are taking different things in our country and it's not evenly distributed and I, I, it's just, that's kind of where I came down to make myself feel at peace with it anyway. So I'll just share that. Yeah, Donna, go ahead. <laughs> Do I need that on there? No. You can hear me. Okay. Um, I don't want to come across as caring less. I mean, <laughs> I don't need a granddaughter to then have me care about our environment. But I have consistently felt like it's why we recycle. We should be responsible for what we do. Why we're asking manufacturers to do circular economy. If they produce it, they should handle it and rehandle it until it never ever disappears. And so I feel we are responsible and a responsible thing to do is to do the best we can to improve the discharge and deal with these elements. I do not want to pass it down the road. 
So that's where I'm at. And I'm concerned about, I don't know what standard that is that you just created, because I didn't get the email. You probably, if you send it out, you probably send it to my city email, and I can't get to it from here. So um, that's another long story. So I, I would rather have a standard than I know. That's all. If you've created a one point billion, I'm like Connor. Huh? Vermont <laughs> drinking level standard, I can relate to. So that's all I would want, a standard that's more defined. And our drinking standard probably aren't as good as they should be, not as I would have them, but at least they're there and they're known. So if you can tell me why you chose that in simple layperson terms, I won't oppose it. Otherwise, I prefer a standard that's more knowable. That's all. So I, th I think Lauren's language only dealt with the testing, and I believe that you said the 20 parts, but that, that was the Vermont drinking standard. I that believe is why it. I heard his motion. I'm sorry. No, he said, he said the 20 parts per billion, but that is the Vermont drinking standard. I believe that's what I, yeah. I, the, the one, the, so I was confused because I didn't have the, the email. I just forwarded it to you, by the yeah. way, to your other address. Lauren was talking about one part per trillion just so, because you can never get to zero. And I said, well, let's keep the deadline of 2023, but set the standard at the Vermont drinking water standard of 20 parts per trillion. Okay. That, that's my that's rationale. My Just, I've heard the other one. Thank you. Fair enough. This, I'll, I, I agree that this, um, I feel like we could keep talking about this for a long time. <laughs> We have motion. To, yeah, I know we've got a motion, and well, and because part of me um, still wrestles with, in all honesty, like if they're going to go ahead anyway, then do well. Then why, you know, why would we bring it to Montpelier? You know what? But yeah, I think. I, but I so I, I just I genuinely feel conflicted about that. Um, I do feel like it's important to be part of. I, uh, yeah, I I see this as part of the healing, also. Right, this is part of being responsible. Anyway, that's that's just what, what's going on inside my head. Anyway, um, any other thoughts or conversation or conversations? Any thoughts or comments about this? Uh, and if uh, any other city staff want to weigh in on what we're about to vote on. That would, that's welcome. <laughs> I just want to give you the opportunity if you want to. I just want to understand the motion has to be, uh, stop taking about a year and a half if we don't meet uh, drinking water standards, Vermont drinking water standards. Um, but just we heard from Casella that only the pilot system will be on at that time. So that would mean that we're either stopping taking leachate um, at that time, or we're only taking, you know, the percentage, the 10% or so um, of what is treated. So just want to, you know, make that clear for council that it's essentially saying we're not going to take leachate anymore. Um, because from the timelines Casella has laid out, they're not going to have full scale treatment within that time frame. 25 to have full scale. So one one option would be um, that the pilot system, one alternative motion for council's <laughs> consideration. <laughs> and it's fine if you don't want to do that. I mean, that's okay. <laughs> it's getting late, I understand. <laughs> um, is, is to require that the um, that the uh, effluent from the or the treated um, um, leachate from the pilot system. Um, meets is at one one or less parts per trillion um, by 2023, the year and a half time frame, and then we could use um, that standard, the treated um, system from the pilot, to require that on the next as the next kind of requirement. You know, the council would meet again, set a new motion that the full scale would have to meet what the pilot achieved. It's just another way to approach it that. Uh, but I understand this is a tough topic, and yeah. of course we'll support whatever yeah. council decides. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Well, 
And you brought up a point, I guess I've always felt that this is not necessarily the, the door shuts, but that we really stop and reassess. This is our gold and we don't reach the gold. I didn't assume that would be an automatic door slamming, but that we'd be sitting down reassessing what we know, why we know it, why they didn't happen. Does that need to be written in here? Or does no one else feel that way? Uh, Jeff? I don't think it needs to be written because I think that we could always revisit the decision and decide to do something else based on information that's coming to us as we proceed. And so I, you know, who knows if any of us will be on the council on uh, July 2023, but uh, in the months leading up to that, we will be continuing to get reports on how things are progressing, how, when they expect to get to the best possible standards, and we could at that point say, okay, you're doing exactly what we wanted you to do, and we're going to uh, give you more time to get there. I can easily imagine that happening. Well, and that's written in the letter, right? That, mm -hmm. that we, we expect increased um, monitoring and testing, that we have quarterly reports from um, ANR, and thankfully, Excella being part of those, um, and then an opportunity before next year's budgeting to, to revisit so that our DPW can, you know, adjust as needed. So I don't think that that's outside. I mean, that's, that's written in, so, yeah. So maybe that's a commitment to ourselves that we'd like to reevaluate this uh, situation by in a year. Just looking at the the letter, are you, you're right, Jay's. Of course, he's correct. He's one of the authors, but he clearly <laughs> states council will revisit this policy and timeline to make any desired adjustments on it before November 2022. So next year at this time. So they're saying as of July 1, 2023, we won't take it, but we're going to review this in November of 2022 to see if we want to adjust. Mm -hmm. So it's actually more clearly stated mm -hmm. than I recall. Or we could say tomorrow we're not taking any more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the point. I mean, yeah. it, I, you know, maybe the pilot project, you know, progresses further, but I just think it's important that we're saying that, hey, this is a, this is a time frame that we're holding to. Um, and that it's not open ended. You don't have more time. Be prepared, you know. So, yes, it could go either direction. But the point is, yes, we have the opportunity to revisit. But it's it's making sure that there's accountability throughout the whole process. I think even going 18 months to some of us maybe feels a little bit long. But knowing that there's account accountability built into that time frame, I think is really important. And the pilot. Uh, pretreatment testing should be, even though it's not the whole, it's not the full scale, it should um, be treating some portion of the leachate at Casella by July of 2023. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Some portion will, will be being so we'll, treated. We'll see, we'll know results. Right. Be close. Yeah. So by the permit, we must be operational in the pilot one year from issuance of the permit. So assuming the permit is issued, let's just call it January 1st, we must be operational right. by January 1st, 2023. So in November 2022, when we're all sitting here in this room, just trying to yeah. make sure you may or may not be operational. You may you'll be close. Joe and I probably hope not to spend Christmas at yeah. the landfill, so we'd, we'd like to be. <laughs> I spend Christmas every year at the landfill. <laughs> picking oh, up okay. candles. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, dump picking. Okay. Candles. Well, the idea that we would revisit it in a year is also a uh, comfort to me. Anyway, we'll, have, we'll know more. We'll be a little further in this process. Uh, all right, any further discussion about this? Okay, um, and just 
checking into nobody else online who would like to say anything. All right, um, all in favor, please, or there's a, been a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so the motion passes. And so that we have um, something to give to a and R comments on this permit. And just so I'm crystal clear, so the language will change from any detectable PFAS to um, PFAS chemicals above the Vermont drinking water standard. Like mm -hmm. I think actually leaving it that, I mean, if by some chance they change the drinking water standard, hopefully to make it more protective in the next year and a half, that would, could keep us at least up to date with them. And, that's, um, and then with that monitoring language yeah. that, yeah. I don't know, Donna, if you got that, um, but that just adds the upstream and downstream and that we want baseline testing. Yep, yep. So, okay, you, I could- You I can could, edit that, send it, then we'll edit, get it submitted. Send. And it. Okay, great. Beautiful. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you, staff. <laughs> yes. Thank you, staff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Smudge everybody when we leave. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nice. Same. Okay. Uh, that is all of our business. Um, council reports. I want to start with Donna. Shocking. Okay, yes. Thanksgiving is coming next week. I hope you're all better prepared than I am. Um, but I do have one request that's more on the serious note, and that is you all had Doug and Paco here when I was gone talking about the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. And in talking with the twin city teams, which is Barry and Montpelier's public safety staff and the city managers from both cities, they have reflected to me that they would like to, to take the public safety authorities report and look at those recommendations and come out with, their, with the next step, especially how to fund the 3.9 million uh, equipment that came out of those recommendations. And they would just like to work as they do as a staff committee. And I would like to know, and I think Bill would too, a nod if indeed the council supports the city staff putting that time in to try to advance a capital purchase on the public safety items. And then they'd be working as a team and they can invite whoever they want in, including the consultant that we'll make available to them to try to advance those recommendations that came out of that study. If people have a, a nod, a thumbs up, that would be good to, to yeah, have yeah. the staff no, actually, do that. I asked Donna to raise it. I think we, we, there had been that agenda item to appoint us as a formal committee. And I think we just said, hey, if we're staff, we can work together. But before we put, you know, if the, the council, either council doesn't want to pursue the Televate study anymore, tell us now before we spend a lot of time with this. Okay. You know, I'm not guaranteed, again, like anything else, you're not committing to it, but we're not going to keep. Yeah. Sounds okay. good. Yeah. The thumb is up across the table there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now just to uh, you, some of you may have been familiar with the Karen Kitzmiller's coat drive and my Montpelier Rotary Club took that over. And last year due to the pandemic, we didn't collect used coats. We actually made a deal with Lenny's and bought retail coats. We did the same thing this year. And there's some like 800 coats that we're distributing. So I, I just want you to know that is in the works and people will have those coats. Uh, again, supply chain is hard, but we did fundraising and believe it or not, people who have done this for years bought our raffle tickets and had a big social party, still bought raffle tickets, still donated the money for the coats. It was really very uh, heartwarming to know that people will come and, and support that effort. And there's kids, there's people, on the street, but there's all sorts of families coming who just need winter coats. So it feels really good. And I hope you have a chance to support it in the future if you haven't already. Your question, Karen? Yes. So I can... you got to come up here. Yep. yep. So I can let the homelessness task force know and other folks who might need those coats. Has those already been distributed or how do they get? Sure, to... sure. They could, yeah, they could. How, who do they contact? I'll, I'll find that. Remember, okay, thank sorry, you. I, should know that. I thought you were volunteering for a winter coat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Okay, uh, Connor. 
Yeah, right. I'm going to continue being a bit contrary tonight. You know? <laughs> That's right. So on, uh, on Monday, the legislature will reconvene for a special session there to consider a uh, compromise that the governor has put out saying that, uh, all right, the governor doesn't support a statewide mask ban, right? But he's willing to consider a deal where municipalities on an individual basis may be able to institute one but they're going to have to reconsider it every month and they're not going to be able to do it past April. Every month they have to reconsider it at a meeting if they want to keep it going. So I, I just like, you know, I, you know I, I'm a bit upset that I don't like, you know, municipalities being treated like political footballs in this case, you know, either it's the right move for a statewide mandate or it's not. But I think we've seen like studies show that the piecemeal approach doesn't work and really what it is the executive branch uh, shirking the responsibility and passing what should be a statewide responsibility onto municipalities, which isn't effective. And all it is, is a political soundbite. Um, so I just want to tell everybody, I'll be- You want us to sign your petition? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess I'm taking, I'm taking the temperature. Should there be a collective response on this before it goes to print on like? Monday for the special session that we don't support this or I mean I, I'm happy to do something individually too but um, I'm just letting you know I, I, I just don't like it you know it's yeah, yeah it's not right it's, so, it's, it's my report Thanks. yeah <laughs> <laughs> if you, um, um, I'm losing brain cells but um, if you need anything more formal from us let us know I mean, I guess it's a question. Do other people feel similarly? Or I agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I would support a collective approach saying that, that, you know, passing the buck down to municipalities, you know, where yeah, there's no clear borders. I mean, it just is ridiculous. It, it's, it's, it's a waste of time. I mean, we've, we've done it in the past when, like, you know, there was no other option. There was, you know, yeah. the state of emergency had been just passed. And I guess I don't regret doing it at that point, but Mm -hmm. You know, we're a year into this. It seems silly. So to be fair, if we do get that authority, I think we should take it seriously. Yeah. Like if or yeah, when that yeah, happens. Sure. But should there be a statewide approach? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's where I am. Yeah. I, I think that th this is the the one train that's going to get us to having the authority to uh, create a mask uh, regulation here in Montpelier. I, uh, because he's already said he's going to veto anything else, and I think he probably will. So, so if, if the question is, do we pass something encouraging our two representatives and our three senators to vote against the uh, proposal, I, I clearly would not support that because we think we should have that authority. Should we consider maybe putting uh, Charter amendment on the ballot to say <laughs> we want the authority to uh, to create a a public health order when it's uh, you know whatever the language would be then we might want to consider that uh, so it's not limited to just the present crisis. No. But that's a, that's not a question we need to deal with in ten o'clock tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and, and I, I'm not even saying like when it gets to the legislature, our delegation should vote against it. But I, I I don't think like you know playing games like this should not be called out in a public fashion. And if we support a statewide mass ban, we should tell the governor that in some formal manner. Yep. So we should direct Bill to write a letter or the, the mayor. Either way, we do it on behalf of you all. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And you yeah. feel like you've got uh, the the sense of yeah. <laughs> this conversation. Got it. You're okay. this I'll, just, I'll just point out, and 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 I personally agree with the sentiments, but I'll just point out that typically the municipal governments are seeking to have our own individual um, decision making authority and resisting state mandates on us. <laughs> so um, this is, this is a, pretty much a 180 on that. However, I, you know the no, no, I get it, but, and, and I think the distinction is for just like with things with pollute, you know, the, the whole notion of state and federal regulations for things that don't recognize boundaries, and this is clearly right. something that doesn't. Right. That said, we we might take the authority to protect at least people within our boundaries and require it. 
Just pointing out that we're. Um, I don't know where the <laughs> sneeze and towels would come out of that. Yeah. 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 I'm complete, thank you. Okay, <laughs> Jack. Uh, just two points. One, uh, we all heard this week that uh, Senator Leahy announced that he's not running for re-election. And uh, as a great senator, a great son of Montpelier, who's done tremendous work, not just for the uh, United States, but specifically for Montpelier. You go downtown, see the... Uh, what his, uh, the funds he's brought to the city has done for us at the library and probably many other places. It, he'll have plenty of time for recognition, but I think he, he deserves that recognition. And just on a very much lighter note, in through our uh, debates tonight, I noticed the uh, the use of the word y'all from at least three members of the council, counting the mayor. So I think maybe, maybe the, the influence of the assistant city manager is uh, making itself known. Yeah. And I didn't even hear you. <laughs> All right, Lauren. Great. Well, you took my rant on the mask mandate <laughs> off the table. Thank you. Check that <laughs> off my list. Um, the just wanted to acknowledge the good work of the activists that pushed the administration to actually extend the hotel program for our unhoused population. So was I know that we still have lots of work to do, lots of issues and lots of things that our community can still do, but it was Great to finally see that move through, thanks to some great activism and work from lawmakers pushing the administration, so yay. Um, and lastly, our little lobbying committee is gonna meet next week. So if anyone has policy ideas of advocacy or policy positions that you think we all should be supporting as a city that could go on that um, legislative agenda, um, would welcome everyone's input. Uh, I would just remind folks that uh, tomorrow at four o'clock uh, we're going to have a rededication of the Challenger Explosion um, uh, Memorial, which is at uh, Montpelier High School. It's sort of uh, by the very small orchard that we have there. Um, and so, yeah, that, I think that is it for me. And no, John's not here. So, yeah. Um, Jack, I would just say that um, if it were up to you, we'd all be saying "use guys," right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have a couple of things. I she already mentioned the, <laughs> the um, lobbying committee, so that's good. Just a reminder that actually the alternate side parking went into effect this past Monday, November fifteenth, and we will begin active enforcement next week on Monday the twenty second. So everyone's got a week to get used to doing that, but park on the odd side on odd nights and the even side on even nights. Fortunately, we haven't had really much plowing. And um, just more seriously, just to get you folks prepped for the next time we get together, um, we spent virtually all day in this room with the department heads working on the budget, half day yesterday on Zoom and some more time. And um, I think all of us collectively as a team, and perhaps all of you had some hopeful illusion that everything was back to normal. <laughs> and I think, I, I think that we got a big reality dose this week. And um, I, I described it to the mayor as saying, uh, we have developed really good appetites, but our cupboard and refrigerator is still not full. And so we've had to make some you know hard decisions um and so we're trying to res clearly reflect the, the strategic plan and the priorities um and also the, the departmental needs and, and all of that but i guess what i'm here to say is um 
it will certainly not meet all needs, um, what's recommended, um, probably not even close. And um, I think we have to remember that we cut the budget last year uh, over 4% because of COVID. And so we're trying to come back from that reduction, but our revenues are, you know, parking and rooms, meals and alcohol were the big ones are just not, they're, they're coming back, they're better, but they're not back to where they were. So even getting sort of back to where we were with all of the priorities that we've laid out, which were ambitious and plentiful, um, are gonna be very difficult. So we're, we're doing the best we can. We're trying to stay within the guidelines that you gave us with the, the surveys, and I think we'll do that. Um, but just... It's not as rosy as maybe we It's hoped. not gonna be that great thing where we just do all of that list and say, whew, we did, we did figured out what it was cost, right? To do all of that list and it was 12% uh, or something like that, tax increase. So we figured that wasn't in the cards. 12%, yeah, that's- uh, I, I think we'll have to work really hard with our community because maybe we haven't shared enough of the pain with them. They really think everything's back. And I think we all did. Yep, you know, obviously. You know, but I mean, all, everyone, yeah all of us here yep. and all of us and you know people were asking for the thing and we we're all like yeah we're, this is going to be great and yep. it, it's it's still it's still not all the way back and i suspect probably local businesses feel the same way and another so yes it's better yes we're coming out of it yes we'll probably be able to do better on our services but our not capital better. projects and our some of our extras are going to still be tight unless you do, unless you tell us otherwise in which case we can go back to the drawing board. So, yeah. Okay. On that cheery note. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, <Nice> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> a little reality. Okay. Uh, all right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so, that is the end of our regular business. So, um, without objection, we are going to adjourn 10.08. Fair enough. Deceptively short.